morning, everybody. Great seeing you. Sorry, I was just on the call busy. Um, just sorting out our screen this side. Morning, everybody. Great morning, morning. Sorry, I was just on the call busy. Just sorting out our screen this side. All right, so ladies and gents, here we are. It is uh, today, the 26th of May. And we're proudly being hosted by Global Trade Solution. And um, now we've been looking forward to this event for quite some time. And uh, the, 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 the theme for today's event is cargo security and its role in eliminating disruptions in global trade. And I want to make use of this opportunity to, to uh, thank um, Marcel uh, from Global Trade Solution and Louise for you know assisting and putting together this program for us today with an excellent uh, panel of speakers and uh, we believe that this will be very much worth your while. Um, so yes, uh, ladies and gents, just some housekeeping while we're still allowing people into the meeting is please keep yourselves on mute. Um, if you accidentally unmute yourself, I will mute you again and uh, yeah, keep your eye in the inbox. Should something go wrong with the meeting, we'll send you an email to rejoin. Um, that's never happened, so we believe it will go all well. You're welcome to use the chat room. At the bottom of your screen, you click on chat. You're welcome to use the chat room. There you can post questions uh, to the panelists. We, we will only take questions at the end of the event today. Um, you know, so we're not going to encourage questions during presentations, so we can focus on the presentations. And uh, the, the participants box, you can click on participants, you can see all the people in the event, and you can mouse over your own name and rename you yourself uh, if need be. Maybe the device name is showing or not your name. So it's as simple as that. And uh, yeah, so the transport forum uh, is um, complementary to all participants and including the related content on our website. And obviously to, to be able to do this, we've got valued sponsors and alliances in the transport sector that's making the transport forum um, possible. And we would like to give recognition to this. And uh, I want to quickly just put up our screen, our program for today, so that we can start with this. So there we go, um, 26th of May, cargo security and its role in eliminating disruptions in global trade, Cl proudly being hosted today by Global Trade Solution. All right, so ladies and gents, um, we're going to have some fun, um, but okay, let's quickly look at the second half of the program. Um, there's the first half. And there's the second half. We will you know, go through the program later on. I want to draw your attention quickly to the Saboa conference uh, of the 9th of June. Um, and there's a gala then on the 8th of June. There's an exhibition. This is uh, obviously um, at the Johannesburg Expo Center in collaboration with Future Road. It's a Future Road exhibition. And it's going to be an excellent uh, session to attend. So you can go to the Transfer Forms website, you'll see this banner there, click on it and you can register yourself. It is a paid event, the gala dinner is 800 rands per person, the conference is 500 rands per person, but it'd be worth your while. The exhibition obviously is complimentary and that is <clears throat> co-located with the Auto Mechanica um, exhibition. So it's going to be very interesting to attend. All right, so that's that thing. What we're going to do now is we're going to um, do some prize winning. Um, and there, there will be four prizes today. Um, all right, so Global Trade Solution informed me this morning that they're going to actually give two prizes. Um, and uh, the first prize is uh, the pension if it's female or male, it will be um, a spa voucher or a goodie, a spa goodie bag. Um, you know, uh, supplied by Global Trade Solution. And they're also going to give a golf voucher. So those are two great prizes by Global Trade Solution, our host today. Thank you very much, Global Trade Solution, for that. We're also going to do two prizes from the Transport Forum sponsors. Uh, we're going to have two of these 
chargeable lights, the one that we're going, the, the two we're going to, to hand out today is actually more advanced than one you see in the picture. It's also solar uh, in, in, in power, you know, so it can charge itself uh, by solar energy. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to tell you more about our alliances and our sponsors. And then after that, we're going to ask questions about them. And the person who answers the question correctly um, in the chat room, the first one who, answering the question, who answers the question correct, that will be the winner of that prize. And we will then courier the prize to that person. Um, so obviously, we will indict you after the event to get your delivery address and so on. Um, all right, so lots of fun here for prizes. So listen carefully to what we share about our alliances and our uh, sponsors. So ladies and gents, there we go. We're in alliance with, with on this stage, with five uh, professional industry bodies, South African Association of Freight Forwarders, South African Express Parcel Association, South African Bus Operators Association, South African Rail Industry Association, and the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. And I'm very glad to announce this morning uh, Gaiman Kelly, the CEO of the Road Freight Association, and uh, shared with us that they're also joining the Transit Forum in a formal alliance. So we'll be very proud in announcing this. So the next time the Road Freight Association's logo will be in there as well. Thank you very much for that, Gavin. So quickly, um, ladies and gents, recognition. Should somebody of that organization would like to say something, please interrupt me. You're most welcome. And you can also say a few words. So the alliance here, the bus and coach industry, they represent the bus and coach industry, Saboa. Very proud and having them as a formal alliance. Obviously, you can get the links to all these organizations on the Transfer Forms website. There's African Association of Freight Forwarders. the National Association of Members of the Republic of South Africa. Makes a major contribution to facilitating trade without, within South Africa. They're in, Lots of work also in smart borders and so on. So we're very proud in being associated with the African Association of Freight Forwarders. So African Express Parcel Association is a representative body of, uh, and voice of the express delivery industry in South Africa, SAPA. Area African Rail Industry Association. Lots of work in terms of revitalizing our rail infrastructure in South Africa and rail operations and doing lots of work in getting in third party access into our rail system. Charter Institute of Logistics and Transport, it's a leading international professional body for everybody who works within the supply chain, logistics and transport. Thank you, Seltza. And we've got three formal media alliances with the Transport Forum. So we're very proud of this, ladies and gents. Um, and, and uh, the first one we're looking at here is Freight News, uh, also actually known in the past as, as um, Freight and Trading Weekly. Now, Freight and Trading uh, Weekly, um, established, innovative, effective, they say, found, uh, founded in 1953 by John Marsh. Um, so all about logistics uh, in the industry, you should subscribe to these newsletters to be kept up to date. The African Railways, Railways Africa. So Africa, Railways Africa is the African continent specialist trade, technical business to business online publication covering all aspects of the rail sector. And we've got Engineering News. So we're very proud of Engineering News. They also share with us a, a weekly video. And uh, I would like to share this video with you. I must just get it up and our screen here. Just a moment for me. Hello and welcome to the roundup of this week's edition of the Engineering News and Mining Weekly magazine, published on Friday, 27 May 2022. In this week's cover article, Engineering News and Mining Weekly Senior Deputy Editor Irma Fenter writes that South Africa's road repair strategy of fixing the worst first is no solution amid rapid road deterioration. South African National Roads Agency Limited, or SANREL, says that a lack of preventative maintenance is by far the biggest contributor to the deterioration of the South African road network. 
the engineering news features focus on power, energy and water, where the first hydrogen burning power plant is operational. Health and safety, where a remote solution makes alcohol testing more accessible. And construction, where construction mafias are driving away civil engineering skills. The Mining Weekly features focus on mining in Botswana, where Botswana's mining sector is on the rebound. And Consulting Engineers in Mining, where miners are relying more on consulting engineers. This week's business leader is Christopher Green, partner and corporate team leader in Johannesburg at law firm Hogan Levels. And as this week's cartoon shows, there's no question that South Africans are far better prepared for rotational power cuts than they were when the scourge first appeared some 14 years ago. Nevertheless, the cuts remain painful and are both economically damaging and psychologically draining. We hope you enjoy this week's edition of Crema Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly, the magazine that offers you news about developments in the real economy. Happy reading and see you next time. Thank you very much, Engineering News, for this great support to the Transport Forum. We really appreciate that. Um, ladies and gents, let's continue. Now we're going to have a look at our sponsors, and our host for today is Global Trade Solution. So maybe one of Global Trade Solution will tell us a little bit more about GTS. Maybe Louise wants to do that during the presentation. Uh, Founded in South Africa in 1999, GTS delivers innovative technology and consulting services to the international trade and supply chain community. And uh, we will hear a lot of them today. Thank you very much for your kind support. C-Track is uh, the platinum sponsor of the Transport Forum. It's a leading global software as a service and a big data company for vehicle tracking, fleet management, and insurance telematic solutions. So important nowadays to be connected and to be visible. Thank you, C-Track, for your platinum sponsorship. Also being part of the Transport Forum since the inception more than 15 years ago. University of Johannesburg, well, they've been part of the Transport Forum as well. Prof. Jackie Walters, Prof. Nalin Pisa, they've been involved with the Transport Forum since inception. University of Johannesburg with the Department of Transport and Supply Chain Management. So also got the Institute for Logistics and Transport. So very proud in having University of Johannesburg as part of the Transport Forum. So here we've got Ticket Pro Travel. You can see a lot of solutions. Ticket Pro Travel is providing an online booking tool, a corporate online booking tool, no hidden fees, um, and lots of value proposition to using that travel projected business guardian, cutting edge innovation. It's an online corporate traveling booking tool with everything you need and nothing you don't want. So thank you very much, Ticket Pro Travel, for your gold sponsorship. We also have uh, from Ticket Pro the Smart Tab solution. Smart Tab includes key features like comprehensive route management, flexible passenger payment methods, flexible route and fare product setup, shift and dispatch management, cashier system inspection tools, and comprehensive management information system and reports. Thank you, SmartTab, for your gold sponsorship. JC Auditors. JC Auditors, um, certification, compliance, one solution. They are SANAS accredited certification body providing internationally recognized certifications. Thank you very much, JC Auditors. And I've created us online to tell us more about BISCO. Uh, thank you, Harry. Uh, it's Valeen today. Um, morning. Morning, uh, Harry. Um, thank you. Uh, we are BISCO. We are a skills development training provider focusing on uh, distribution, manufacturing, and supply chain management. Um, we offer our learning solutions um, in three options, uh, online, uh, a blended option, and also facilitated training. So for all supply chain related training, BISCO is the place to be. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Appreciate your support and uh, great and proud having Bisco as part of the Transport Forum family. Thank you very much, Bisco. But the cargo fulfills the needs of the express cargo industry for daytime and overnight cargo capacity across a comprehensive Southern and East Africa footprint. It's a leading cargo airline providing express airport to airport solutions and related services to the courier and express logistics industry. So proud and having but their cargo as part of the transport forum. Thank you very much for your gold sponsorship. Zutari. Zutari is a um, consulting engineering group, uh, also been known as Oricon, been part of the transport forum as gold sponsorship uh, for many years. Consulting engineering of note, they say impact engineered. Thank you very much, Zutari, for your gold sponsorship. Mobility, acting on behalf of mutual and federal risk uh, financing. They say they're the human face of insurance, commercial insurance, underwriters, niche insurance products since 2011, bus and coach insurance specialists. Thank you very much, Mobility. Indware Risk Services, one of the largest independent brokers offering personal business and specialized risk and insurance advisory services. Thank you, Indre. Initron Supply Chain Solutions. Innovation expertise delivered. It's a leading provider of integrated transportation, warehousing and supply chain based services to customers' variety of needs, offering bespoke value propositions in each segment. Thank you, Unitrons. Also, proud and having the bank, Standard Bank, part of the Transport Forum, with over 159 years of experience, they believe that dreams matter and together they can make them a reality. They operate in more than 20 countries in Africa and abroad, and the worldwide presence consists of an integrated suite of end to end wealth management services and banking solutions. Thank you, Standard Bank. Kathy Bell from Standard Bank, been part of the Transport Forum also for many years, also very much involved in the road transport management system. They also do their workshops with the Transport Forum. Kuba, transforming ticketing, part of the IC Mobility Group, which enables public and private transport to move into the digital area. So it's journey planning, smart ticketing, streamlining electronic payment, shaping the, dis the digital transformation of the mobility sector. Easy Clear, software solutions for custom clearing, freight forwarding, and logistics providers covering AC, road, and road. Thank you very much, Easy Clear. Obunya Capital, so bespoke taxi industry insights, IPT and in advisory. So it's great having them on board. Um, they see themselves as the public transport knowledge hub, and you're welcome to contact them should you be in need of any IPT and A advisory or taxi industry insights. So let's give our sponsors and alliances a big hand. They, um, they're on the screen now. So making the transfer forum possible so that we can have all this content complementary. I just want to remind you, ladies and gents, about our business directory. So the business directory uh, is a very popular, well-categorized um, business directory where you can promote your business uh, to be listed here is only 450 rands a year. Um, it's Olga Mashilu. You can see a number there on the screen. You can take a picture, contact her, and she can help you to get your company listed in this business directory. Very popular. So there's the Transfer Forum website, for those who don't know it yet. Um, so the presentations you see here today, those have been made available including all these uh, presentations presented over the past 15 years. All of them are available on our downloads feature, a knowledge hub, we call it. Uh, it's more than 900 presentations there that you can um, obtain as much as information as that you would like to have. Um, obviously, you need to, to be registered with the Toronto Forum. That's the deal um, that we can keep you up to date with our activities. Um, so to do that, you need to log into the left of your screen being on the Transform website. Since you not have an account yet, 
then you can select sign up and the sign up feature then will take you through a simple registration process. You create your own username and password and you can log in. And once you've logged in, then you can go to downloads under events. And when, once you've done that, you get the simple little search engine. The top field there, you can type in what you're searching for, logistics or buses or whatever, or a person's name. Hit search and it will bring up all the presentations related to that. Or you can go to category and at category, you can select the day of the event and search and it will bring up those presentations for you. All right, so now, ladies and gents, we're going to do this fun part, and that is the prize winning. And you now, you you won, you can be one of the four lucky winners winning a prize this morning. And um, the way you're going to do this is you're going to go to your um, to the chat room, and you're going to make use of the chat room to answer the questions I'm asking. So the rules are, we unfortunately can only do this for local people, South African people. Um, we also can, um, if you uh, employee of the, the organization that the question is all about, please then hold your horses. Let's give other people an opportunity to answer the question. All right, so let's have that rule this morning. So the first question I'm going to ask this morning, um, this organization, they say they, um, and, and let's okay. Let's let's say this first prize. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, the first prize. Now let's make the first prize for um, the spa voucher or the goodie bag. Uh, you know, sponsored by Global Trade Solution. And the question is, which in a university has been part of the transport forum since? inception so let's have a look at the chat room the first person all right there we go <laughs> yes <laughs> many of you let me see the first one they seems to me was victor victor congratulations on that one i'm just making notes here so victor one that's voucher all right the second prize is a golf voucher so i suppose it's, if you're a golfer then you would answer this question so um, the golf voucher question then is, there's an organization, they say they uh, deliver innovative technology and consulting services to the international trade and supply chain community. Um, and they're also our host for today. There we go, we've got the answer here. Susan De Brain, congratulations. You won that one, so let me just make a note here. So obviously Global Trade Solution will be in contact with you guys afterwards to make arrangements so that you can receive your prizes. So let's do another two prizes from the Transport Forum. You can win um, those nice uh, solar charged lights. Um, so the next question then is, which organization has an online booking tool, a corporate online booking tool? There we go, Victor, you've got it. <laughs> Victor, aren't you already a winner of the previous one? Let's see who was after Victor. Daniel, let's give this one to Daniel. And just make sure I'm right here. Now, Victor, you're obviously very sharp, so uh, you already won the first one. So let's give this one, Daniel Maton. Congratulations, Daniel, you won that one. Just make a note again here. So the, the winner of Daniel Maton said it is Ticket Pro. And that's a correct answer, Ticket Pro. All right, then the last question for the last uh, solar light. Uh, the question is, there's a, uh, the industry association and they say they represent the bus and coach industry who are they 
There we go. Let me see. Carl, Carl Skickerman, seemed to you were the first one. So, Carl, oh, Daniel, you were right, but uh, you already won the prize there. So, let's give this one to Carl Skickerman. Carl, uh, Carl, congratulations. You the winner of that one. So, we will be in contact with you uh, related to your prizes. Congratulations to our winners. We're very proud of you winning with the Transport Forum. And thank you for Global Trade Solution for making this possible. So let's move back to our program. And I would like to introduce you now to our host of today. It's Mr. Louise Widgets. He's the Chief Executive, Executive Officer of Global Trade Solution to do the official welcome for us. Thank you very much, Louise. Thank you very much, Harry, and good morning to everybody from a rather cold and chilly Cape Town this morning. I was actually in Gauteng yesterday, and everybody said to me, it's very cold in Gauteng. Um, you guys are obviously not used to what real cold is, um, because it was a beautiful day yesterday in Gauteng. Um, Harry, once again, I want to extend my thanks to the Transport Forum and for all the hard work that um, you continue to do um, for the industry. We really appreciate it. And I think I just want to ask if everybody um, can just um, have a spare a thought. Um, we lost a giant this week in the industry. Mike Schuschler uh, passed away. And I think we just need to take a moment to recognize what he did and contributed to our industry um, over all these years and the de dedication and commitment that he, he had. Um, we pass our thoughts on to his family um, and also wish them all the strength in this very difficult time. So, Mike, we salute you and go well, friend. And we hope that you can now have the time available that you never had with all of us bugging you before. So, um, Harry, thank you very much for that opportunity. I also want today um, thank you, thank all our speakers. Um, for being available to us. Um, we know that it's always difficult um, between your work obligations to be available to contribute to the industry, but we really appreciate it. We have found that the Transport Forum has become a neutral platform where a lot of information and a lot of insight is shared um, on a monthly basis. And we really want to extend our thanks to everybody that's participating. Ray, we know that you're very busy. Also our colleagues from the USA, DHL, um, and um, the people joining us today. From our perspective, we want to extend a very big thanks for all your contributions. Um, for some of them, it's really early in the morning. I think this uh, subject that we're covering today fits in very nicely with the, I don't know if everybody in this group is aware, um, the World Customs Organization every year um, has World Customs Day. It's early in January. And then they put a theme forward for the year. And the theme for this year is really scaling up the um, digital transformation of customs authorities. And I think what we're going to be talking about today around um, how we can ensure security and safety with cargo and container movement um, is very important in that aspect. We just simply don't have the capacity anymore to um, do manual enforcement. We need to look at ways where we can digitize these processes and ensure that we still get trade facilitation with the counter of enforcement and risk management from a customs perspective. I also want to take the opportunity to congratulate Ray um, she has um, um, got a very prestigious position at the World Customs Organization as the vice chair of the Safe Working Group. And maybe in context, the Safe Working Group at the World Customs Organization is the only working group where we've got private sector and customs um, together, working together. Um, both the private sector and customs holds um, chair and vice chair positions. And Ray has been appointed as the vice chair. And she's also the first person from Africa to hold this position. So congratulations from the industry, Ray, on this very prestigious and well-earned position. 
and we know that you're going to be flying the continental flag for us um, and ensure that Africa is positioned correctly and that we can be seen in the correct light. And on that very high note, I want to hand over back to Harry to introduce the speakers and I wish all of you a very informative session and then we'll have a Q&A session and a wrap up um, at the end of the session. So thank you, Harry. Thank you so much, Louise. Really appreciate your support uh, and hosting the day, the day for us today. And uh, obviously you're both sponsored with the Transport Forum. Um, I convinced Marcel to act as MC today. Um, and uh, I'm gladly handing over to Marcel this morning to introduce the speakers to us. Thank you very much, Marcel. No, it's an absolute pleasure, Harry, to be a gold sponsor and to um, have this opportunity to highlight this you know, very pertinent topic. Um, so let us immediately get into the program and I'd like to introduce you all to Ray Vivier. She's the head of accreditation and licensing at SARS. Um, Ray has had a varied career with SARS, most of it in the customs division. Highlights of her career include spearheading the comprehensive modernization of trade processes and even earned the World Bank's most improved customs in the world vote in 2012. So what an accolade. In her current portfolio, Ray is focused on developing cooperative compliance programs with trade partners and government agencies and initiatives, which she's actually leading at the moment, is developing a single regional authorized economic operator program, a single government authorized economic operator program, and the new licensing framework for customs intermediaries. And as Louise mentioned, Ray was elected as the customs vice chair of the World Customs Organization Safe Framework Working Group in 2022. So it's hot off the press. So without further ado, we'd like to hand you over to Ray Vivier and we look forward to your session. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, uh, Harry, Marcel, Louise, for such a lovely, warm welcome. Uh, it is indeed my privilege to share the stage with such distinguished speakers and an audience today. Uh, my gratitude obviously goes to the organizers for inviting me to share the World Customs Organization's framework of standards to secure and facilitate global trade. Thankfully, it's been shortened to SAFE. Um, so I will continue to use, uh, refer to SAFE in the presentation. <laughs> if that's okay with everybody, it's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, Marcel, do you think you could get my presentation up for me? Oh, thank you, Harry. It's a complex document um, and I've tried to sort of break it down into what I consider to be bite-sized pieces or maybe blonde pieces um, so that uh, it's a little more understandable to everybody, thank you. Um, and I think you will agree that whilst it's complex, it's a very compelling framework for buffering international uh, trade supply chain interruptions unexpected events, and also for increasing efficiencies within the supply chain arena. It has evolved over the years um, to become a shared framework of standards. As Louise has indicated, uh, the SAFE uh, Working Group is chaired, co-chaired by the public sector and then also by customs. So it's one of the few where the public sector has a very definite voice and a loud voice. Uh, in terms of those issues that should be considered as, as uh, minimum standards for supply chain security uh, improvement uh, going forward. Um, it is aligned to generally accepted principles of risk management. And you'll see throughout the presentation, there's very much a focus on the requirements of advanced electronic information um, to allow customs and other government agencies to perform their risk assessment before uh, the goods arrive at the port. And that then becomes an obligation on yourselves and logistic uh, 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 companies within the supply chain to provide us with as much information as possible. 
So it not only promotes certainty and predictability at a global level, um, but it also allows for us to have a coordinated response to risks and threats. It also promotes the seamless movement of goods, which is so important for us from a trade facilitation perspective. Um, and that implies for all of you fast appearance terms and faster release terms. And importantly, also an indication of any thefts that may be occurring in the supply chain. So for you, I think that's a benefit uh, in terms of being alerted a lot sooner of uh, issues relating to uh, a loss of goods in a container. It enables integrated supply chain management. Uh, in looking at the uh, definition of integrated supply chain uh, management, um, you know, it it covers the network of suppliers, manufacturers, warehouses, distribution channels, you name it, it's all there. And also looks at not only the product, but also the information that accompanies that product and equally the financial flows that are flowing in within the trade supply chain relating to the import or export of uh, goods. Uh, it does help uh, to uh, allow all of the entities in the supply chain to uh, cooperate more effectively. It does also aid and has very much, for example, if you look at the uh, second pillar, it aids uh, economic prosperity through programs such as also an authorized economic operator program. And uh, it does make it harder. And that's the reason why it's so important for, for all of us to trade illegal goods across borders. The strength and customs cooperation aspect of uh, the SAFE um, improves customs ability to detect and manage high risk shipments um, and also to improve our resource into risk. As you are aware, we have constrained resources. So uh, ensuring that we deploy those uh, resources to the highest risk is, implies that we can do a far better job of protecting both uh, society and our country, and uh, now because of SAFE, even other countries in uh, some of the uh, uh, work that we do to assess the risk and, and verify whether in fact a shipment is risky. The strength of customs to business cooperation, which is one that you're probably a little more interested in, uh, encourages the private sector involvement in designing the customs ecosystem. For those of you that have heard me speak before on the SAS strategy, you'll know that for us, this is a very close link to our, our SAS strategy, where we believe that um, we cannot do this alone. We have to be able to leverage each other's strengths and to cooperate in designing what the optimal future supply chain would look like and how we then improve trade facilitation and security uh, aspects of that supply chain as we move into a future. Um, it also really assists with uh, improving voluntary compliance and again this is something that's very very close to our heart in SARS because we believe that uh, a system, a customs or a tax system should be built, built on voluntary compliance. Um, and therefore it really sits very well within our own strategy. Um, and as I've said before, it does improve trade facilitation and it does uh, help with economic recovery post some of the uh, events that uh, happen in the world. And that for, from my perspective is a great benefit for people like yourselves. The strength and customs to government agency cooperation encourages a more effective resource development uh, deployment. So uh, in a border post, we would want to see that one agency may respond uh, on behalf of all agencies or that there is some sharing of those interventions between all of the agencies. And clearly that would have not only a positive impact on, on risk management, but also a positive impact on trade facilitation and uh, security issues. On the next slide, Harry. Thank you. Um, as I said, it's a complex document. Uh, the pictures are really for me. Um, but, you know, just to underscore the elements of uh, the uh, framework, 
So in other words, the principles of the framework that you'll see are a golden thread through all of the different standards and through all of the different pillars. As I've already alluded to, advanced electronic information, cargo information is uh, required. And it allows us to conduct a risk analysis early in the supply chain. And SAFE also harmonizes those requirements. So we don't have everybody just sending what they feel like, but there's also a harmonization of what is required, when it is required, et cetera, et cetera. Because we can't stop customs and all of government at the borders, cannot stop all goods and cannot check everything, it is really, uh, we are really dependent on an appropriate risk management uh, system and framework to ensure that we are able to focus on high risk goods and the advanced electronic information allows us to do this um, in, in, in the sort of time frames that are far more uh, appropriate uh, for us so we don't rush it that we actually as soon as the goods are shipped we are able to uh, start the risk assessment process. Owned inspections is a, uh, an important aspect of uh, SAFE. And what it says is that uh, what we, in effect, are trying to do is say that when there's a high risk uh, shipment that is identified, the customs authorities in the country of export would uh, do an intervention in that country and, in effect, stop those goods from leaving that country and therefore from uh, uh, hitting the shores, shores of the import country. Um, and that's very important for us. Uh, there is a requirement that, uh, so that is more trade facilitative, that we use uh, customs uses non-intrusive in, uh, inspection equipment to do those sort of interventions. So for example, your large scale cargo X-ray scanners, radiation detectors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that does then extend how customs works in that it allows us also then in South Africa, as an example, to extend our borders to the country of export, which it definitely has a great benefit from a risk and a security perspective. The business partnerships and partnering with the private sector means that uh, traders that meet minimum standards will qualify for benefits that are not available to anybody else. And this is our flagship AO program, Authorized Economic Operator Program. Um, and the benefit for us, of course, is that we acquire uh, access to high uh, quality supply data, your data, in other words, that's owned by yourselves. And that assists us with risk management. It also assists us with um, uh, improved compliance, voluntary compliance levels. And then certainly for you, the benefits, the trade facilitation benefits, and some of the uh, benefits relating to your reputation as an AAO internationally are, uh, of course, quite compelling. On the collaboration with the OGAs, which is, you know, a, a newer addition uh, to SAFE, um, this is to ensure that government responds to the challenges of supply chain security in holistic effective and efficient manner um, and should result in better service delivery, reduced duplication of processes at the borders, cost savings for both us and yourselves, uh, but for us from uh, an economies of scale perspective, uh, fewer but targeted interventions, so we combine our risk management, uh, cheaper transport costs because of less wait times um, and improved information sharing. On the next slide, Harry. These are the pillars of the, the uh, SAFE framework. Now I've seen it shown as sort of, you know, like the pillars of a Greek temple. These are the three pillars and then on top sits the, the five principles or elements. Um, and I saw uh, a very interesting uh, uh, question on a, uh, a, a competency test for, for the SAFE, uh, where they asked uh, why does it have three pillars? And one of the answers was because it was designed in a Greek temple. Um, and since then, I've been unable to get that picture out of my mind, but I refuse to do that 
for this presentation. Um, hopefully you however get the picture that these are the sort of the pillars that support the principles. So there are three pillars that strengthen cooperation and promote the seamless flow of movement of goods. Um, there are the core standards and the components of building a secure international framework and the essential nature of the cooperation of all of the stakeholders. It's an integrated concept. I'm not sure if people are aware of that. The three pillars are meant to complement and do and supplement each other. Um, and so, for example, one wouldn't necessarily be able to move to the second pillar if you were a private sector uh, company applying for AEO unless some of the key elements of the first uh, pillar were actually in place and in effect in your business. Um, and I think some people lose sight of the fact that it is actually complementary and supplementary, all three of the pillars. And again, underscores exactly the point, it's a framework. Um, so when you talk container security, you can't just say container security, it's part of a larger holistic view on improved supply chain security of which containers are but one aspect of that. So in pillar one, there are 11 standards, um, and I will show you on the next slide when we get there, just how complex this becomes. Um, but really and truly, these are 11 standards on how customs administrations work, work more effectively together. And the central tenant of this particular uh, pillar is, of course, the use of advanced electronic cargo information to identify high-risk shipments um, using automated targeting tools as early as possible in the supply chain. And thus the requirement on people like yourselves to start sharing with us advanced electronic information. Pillar two is the, the main purpose there is the creation of an international system for identifying businesses that offer high, a high degree of security guarantees in the supply chain. There are six standards there um, on how customs and business can work together to secure the supply chain. And the goal is to ensure sustainable and long incentives. Um, I've looked at some of the data regarding what the benefits uh, equate to in terms of, of rands and cents. I can give it to you in dollars. Um, and very interesting, I see a recent study from the WCO says that AEOs enjoyed $4 million reduction important airport storage costs because of uh, the AO programs. Um, $1 million in road freight costs, and I think that's linked then to less wait times and a seamless movement of goods across borders. And this one is really important for me, I think, um, and that is $5.8 million in trade-related operational expenses uh, that are enjoyed by an AO. So, from our perspective, it's a compelling program. It allows us to be a lot smarter on how we manage risk and how we uh, manage the relationship between ourselves and yourselves. But I think from your perspective, it's quite compelling in terms of the potential cost savings to your business that would be enjoyed if you were part of the Authorized Economic Operator Program. Pillar three. Uh, has 12 standards that cover how customs and other government agencies, both domestically and internationally, so it's not only just for OGAs within this country, but also for OGAs outside of South Africa, um, how we can pool information and resources and how we can harmonize our processes and our systems to increase security and trade. Uh, the pillar supports coordinated border management standards and single window concepts. It enhances trade recovery, it reduces duplication of effort and ensures more effective risk management. Um, and I think when one thinks of the South African context, we realize that there's still quite a lot that we could do uh, to explore the opportunities offered to improving our customers to other government. Uh, uh, cooperation. We have, from a, a customs perspective, just uh, signed a mutual recognition arrangements with China, which implies 
and AEO in South Africa would enjoy the same benefits uh, in uh, China and vice versa. And I think that is one of the other areas that we know we can certainly expand on to ensure that the AO program has greater benefits uh, for people like yourselves. On the next slide, Harry. This is the one that I said, you know, it's really quite complex. Um, and, and as you can see, there are many, many substandards to uh, or recommendations to uh, the, 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 the 11 standards. Um, so I'm not going to go through every single one of them. Um, I thought I should attempt to at least pull out those aspects that relate to the topic today, which is container safety and security. Um, so number one, obviously, integrated supply chain management. Um, and these are the cornerstone of the pillar, probably the cornerstone of the entire program. Um, it is an essential building block to safe, uh, integrated supply chain management. Uh, it ensures that the ease early intervention based on a risk assessment of advanced e-data from traders and transport uh, logistics operators. It introduces concepts such as the authorized supply chain um, and the unique consignment reference, UCR, as you know it. Um, the controls at departure include those contained in the International Ship and Port Facility Security, or the ISPS code, um, and also then the sharing of real-time data for high-risk shipments between customs administrations. It also includes, and I think this is very important, integrity programs, um, and so can you see the integrity programs used in small or high security mechanical seals. Um, and the use of, you know, it encourages the use of modern technologies to mod monitor the integrity of the container along the supply chain, um, and also encourages working with stakeholders to maintain seal integrity along the entire supply chain. UCR, as you know, ensures that a good is, can be traced through the supply chain, through the uh, unique uh, reference, uh, consignment reference number. And authorized supply chains exist where all entities in the international supply chain are approved by customs. The approval is granted based on meeting secure handling of goods, standards and provisions of information. So it takes a, a little further and it's then saying, if you are trading between your AO in the country that we have an MRA with, all of the supply chain entities that would be involved in the movement of those goods, customs would authorize and would then uh, be considered to be an authorized supply chain um, and much work afoot internationally on building uh, these supply chains to allow for uh, the consignment to move from origin to destination uh, and benefit from simplified uh, cross-border procedures. Would be wonderful to have something like this on the continent for goods moving up into the continent. On the next slide, uh, Harry. I see I've lost a few people, so I hope it's not too boring, but yeah, we move sort of like into the future. And I think this is something that we really, uh, and, and probably the best slide uh, for us to, to really uh, pause on, on today. And that is to say, uh, can we be smarter in how we manage the supply chain? Um, and certainly there is an increasing need for transparency, for more efficiencies, for better convenience and for cost effectiveness in the supply chain. And so this slide really and truly just looks at, so what are those things that potentially we could see on the future horizons for the supply, for supply chain security and whether or not SAFE uh, encourages these, which I'm happy to say they do, uh, it does. Um, it's really looking at getting smarter in how we track and trace uh, uh, the goods moving through the supply chain, the money's moving through the supply chain, um, the information moving through the supply chain. And so 
uh, issues like track and trace applications, um, the Internet of Things uh, that are used for freight monitoring and fleet management, or what they call smart containers uh, into the future, um, integrating uh, SEAL programs or SEAL integrity programs with Internet technologies, sensors, GPS tracking, solar panels um, that are then generating data as the shipment is moving. Um, and that then is a whole lot more data than we've had before. So really and truly then exploring the opportunities that uh, blockchain or distribution ledgers offers us to um, receive all of that information and uh, use that information to uh, know exactly where what is and what happened. And blockchain's timestamping uh, feature perfectly fits that demand of the increased need for more information, faster information, and more transparency. Um, and from, from my perspective, why I like blockchain uh, as, a, as a, something we should be really um, exploring is that it becomes a single source of truth and therefore really provides much greater security uh, from, from our perspective. Um, and it's irreversible, unalterable data that really um, provides us with higher transparency, traceability. Um, uh, and I think it becomes really something that we should be looking at to increase the speed of our trade transactions, uh, the dependability of our trade transactions, our sustainability and our flexibility. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to end on that. I hope that uh, you have a better idea of the SAFE framework of standards, what it uh, intends to do, and certainly what the future uh, looks like for people like yourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ray. Uh, well presented. Such a, such a informative listening to you. So I would to myself. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, Ray. Um, golly, so much to chew on there. I think we should have a full day workshop on this. <laughs> and maybe we do it in um, Greece after all. How's that? Um, okay, so as a follow up to that, we have another colleague from SARS, um, Werner Mack. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Werner. Um, Werner is the Senior Manager for Customs Border Operations, Ports of Entry and Customs Compliance at SARS. Um, he's currently the lead of smart border projects at SARS. Um, quite a heavy load, you might say. And Werner's background is electronic engineering and then tenures in banking and engineering sector on systems automation, and since 2005 with SARS on modernization of systems and five years in the IT sector, primarily to automate government systems with new tech. So we eagerly await to hear your views on smart borders and um, we welcome Werner Muck. Thank you. Good morning, um, colleagues, uh, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity that you've given me to speak to you um, on a case that is very dear to us as SARS and to myself as well as a technologist and uh, in an industry that I really think we should be um, addressing when it comes to all the nice new toys that are in the market, um, together with the, the, the rules and regulation that the WCO has set for us. I'm going to try and share the screen now. Um, Harry, is this, um, have you, okay, I'm going to, let's see if this works. Can you all see my screen? Sorry, my signal is a little bit up and down here at the border. We can see you, Werner. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Um, so, I'm, so I was going to introduce and say, coming to you live from a border post, um, which is actually true. We're sitting at the border post and we are assisting in facilitating your trade as much as best as we can. So please bear with us in these trying times. All right. Um, smart borders. Is that, it's not working. It's not clicking. Okay, there we go. Okay, smart borders in the context of the um, of the WCO is um, this technology that has been given to us over the past couple of years 
and um, one of them being uh, blockchain and distributed ledger technology. Um, IoT, Internet of Things, um, you might be all familiar with that concept. Big data analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. These technologies um, have been given to the industry uh, recently in the interest of moving goods across borders more simply and more eloquently um, to secure the trade and to make sure that that uh, technology moves faster or the goods move faster due to technology. Um, excuse me quickly, I just want to get um, half my screen is, is blocked by, by images and things. So I want to see how we can get rid of that. All right, okay, now I can actually see my screen. SARS um, has been given the mandate, one of the, our main responsibilities for customs exercises to have full control of goods entering or leaving South African borders. For this, we will then fulfill the mandate to protect the economy and the borders as well as facilitating legitimate trade. So this is quite a heavy mandate to carry. According to the WCO, changing customs operating environments through technological developments and enhancements in the automated processing capacity results in the reorganization of operational risk map assessment, selection, and targeting of cross-border trade. In order to get to that, SARS has, over the past 10 years now, successfully automated risk assessment, automated the arrival and exit management process, created non-intrusive cargo scanners um, ability and successfully have deployed at all our main borders these technologies, automated inspection and case management workflow, and automated acquittals. In the context of smart borders, SARS endeavors to expand on this. We have since the, in the, over the past couple of months, we have deployed successfully an automated number plate recognition solution for arrival and exit management, which we want to support with automated booms and retractable spikes to make the flow of traffic more, um, more easy because we're having some issues. We have created, we want to create single inspections to avoid multiple stops, which, which contribute to costs and massive delays. Inline um, non-intrusive inspection cargo scanners are planned for the, for the near future. A seal integrity program to track and trace. Inspector body cameras are going to be deployed so that the, the inspectors are being guided by a central command center in their inspection capability. And also to make sure that we have a single sense of um, knowledge that applies to each one of these inspections. Um, command centers will be, scan, will be sharing scanner images, uh, body cameras, and also overlooking the border process as a whole. The National Targeting Center has been is currently being formed in order to combine interagency risk profiling and targeting. Um, alignment of all the border processes, that includes the OGAs. In other words, if, if you come through a border, there will be the the Department of Health, Department of Agriculture, even the, um, the SAPs and the other um, agencies that are currently deployed at the border, which will be working all together as one. The use of customs connectivity with our neighboring countries, that's a big one that we have really established in many of our BLNS countries, which as should have benefited many, many of yours already. And then the implementation of single window processing. The 2B process is based on moving customs and other OGAs to the pre-arrival depots and have the border facility to be the gateway to cross over to neighboring countries once all processes are in the clear. So what it means in reality is we will not be, we will endeavor that nobody queues up in front of borders have to endure being pushed from pillar to post when SARS has cleared you and then another agency needs to go and clear you. To a large degree, this has already been fulfilled. I mean, I have seen personally at the borders how the process is already integrated, however it be on paper and with stamps. 
This will in future be an automated process where the border piece is a fully automated border process, which will mean the border is like a big toll gate effectively. And only exceptions are being dealt with in terms of inspections. The 2P process is based on moving customs and other OGAs to a pre-arrival pre depot. These depots are not going to be located in, in the physical port environment within a sh short distance from the port. The idea is to have these depots within a distance where they don't influence the port process at all. And then treat the port as a gateway to cross over to the other country. The fully automated border processes will then be deployed at the borders and we will only be dealing with exceptions that we cannot deal with any other way at the ports. This will result in an optimized flow through the port trade. Um, I've given you a small illustration here of the smart border concept. So in effect, the known processes are people will be able to declare via the EDI process or via the branch front end process. These processes will have to be completed before a proceed to border is given to the trader. And that is a process that is already in place. This information will then also be shared with our neighbors in order to make sure that they are also in the clear with the, the declaration that has now been to, to be processed into their country. This could if in effect mean if there is a, a certificate or a permit that is required for the other country, that has to be cleared before the truck is allowed to get into the border environment or the vehicle with cargo loaded onto it. In order to keep the borders completely clear from any traffic that needs to wait for something to happen. And if, even if it's something on the other side, when all formalities have been cleared, the system will then check if there is a, a risk in, or is a risk with the cargo, and this cargo needs to be stopped. And the risk will be assessed according to the type of risk that it involves. So, if the risk can be mitigated through a paper trail, that paper trail will then be resolved either at the moment before, in other words, before the cargo is being cleared, or after the fact through an audit process. Then thereafter. There's a decision that will be made whether there's an inspection that needs to take place, a physical inspection for that matter, and whether this inspection can take place at a off-site facility or whether it has to happen in the border. I want to take you to the um, current process that's in the sea environment where depots are being used for imports and exports in order to make this possible. This would be a very similar process for the border, for the land environment. And we are endeavoring through the use of smart technologies like seals and other like non-intrusive inspection um, in a differential way, which basically means you scan at origin and you scan at the port to verify whether the cargo has not been tampered with. This process will then allow the vehicle to, after inspection to then be cleared before the border. And once it's been, it gets to the border, it, a set of complex technological events kick in. These are all controlled by our central command center, which will be manned by, by skilled staff, SARS staff members, as well as other government agencies will be welcome to contribute with the, through the national targeting concept. Once arriving at the border, technolo technologies like scanners, like, like number plate scanners, uh, non-intrusive scanners, as well as um, RFID scanners will be deployed in order to facilitate the movement through the board for the border as quickly as possible. This will include pre-authorization of home affairs for certain for, for passports, so we don't end up with drivers that get to the border that cannot be cleared through the border. Once that, that those formalities have been addressed, then the, car, car, the truck can move through the border seamlessly. If there are problems, in, the, in other words, if there's a suspected contraband and the only place where this apprehension could take place, or an anomaly is found with a non-intrusive inspection, then that, that can be addressed at that moment and there will be capacity at the border to handle that. If vehicles arrive in a, somehow arrive in the border that were not cleared for the border, they will be turned around and be sent back to a, to a location which does not in, influence the flow of the border process. We are expecting our neighbors to follow the same suit and we are working hard to, to engage with them because if you've seen um, on all our borders, there has been 
quite a big endeavor to change the border process on their side to make it also more flu um, fluent and um, upgrade their border posts like we've seen at, um, at the Bight Bridge border post. Okay, um, there are some images you are welcome to go through. This is shared with the, with the, um, with the chairman of the meeting. And um, we will be endeavoring to keep you up to date as these processes happen. The import process, as I previously said, is very similar to it. And it will also make, um, make use of interconnectivity with our neighboring countries, that once that cargo arrives in South Africa, it is a lot more, um, there should not be any problems anymore. That, that information has been shared with us, the declarations have been cleared, and we will not have scenarios where trucks arrive on the border and they do not know why they're exactly there and they still have to start the whole process. We are also attempting to clear the border process environment that we don't have um, just a bunch of people walking in the border with no real purpose, or some of them do have a real purpose, um, which leads to the one of the, the S part of smart borders, which is the securing of our border posts and allowing that the flow of, of, cargo, of legitimate cargo which is not obstructed by any other processes that take place where we are trying to get rid of people that are not supposed to be in the port. The, the smart border concept will also eventually bleed over to the, to the passenger side, which will also attempt to streamline it a lot better and not have unauthorized personnel roaming all over the place in the border post. So border posts will become very clean and clear environments. These border posts should literally be a gateway that leads to another country and not an environment of, uh, which has a whole sub-economy that takes place within it. I thank you for your time. These slides are merely there to, for, for information purposes. You're welcome to read through them. And um, we have our design principles, which we've shared here with you as well as um, the technology that we, have, we are um, going to deploy. And hopefully this will be taking place with, in the next two years. So you should be seeing some massive changes taking part in the big ports. Um, I've listed some pros and cons. And um, on the, the pros are very, very one-sided or very strong. Um, obviously we will be, we are, open to certain elements like cyber attacks, which we've seen our colleagues in, uh, in Portnet um, taking place. Um, and we also have to take cognizance of the fact that all border posts are the same. So we'll be taking that into account in the, in the design process. The readiness of other government agencies is obviously been a hindrance in the past, but there's very good um, talks between us in the interagency discussions and they are as, as keen as we are in order to make this, this work for all of us. The country just has to make this work and we have no choice otherwise, we're just gonna be left behind by, by the world. I thank you for your attention and, and, and the audience. And um, I hope to work together with you um, closely to make this a successful deployment. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Uh, no, you go ahead, Harry. No, I just wanted to end over to you. Thanks. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you for that, Banner. It was really, really inspiring hearing um, the views from SARS this morning. And we thank you for your contributions today. And uh, as industry, we are supporting you every step of the way. So without further ado, I'd like to now introduce the next speaker, um, a gentleman called Dan Garcia. Some of you might have um, heard him speak previously. Um, Dan is a senior analyst um, at Sims Worldwide and has 31 years of experience in supply chain analysis and security management and really is an expert in AEO from a commercial trade and customs perspective. Um, going back to 9-11 and how US Customs had to step in and um, look at making their borders function. And um, Dan was instrumental in that whole process. He has an extensive background in security process design and administration, 
and he has collaborated with high access control organizations, as I mentioned, the US government and many global customs agencies and various multinational companies across the world. Um, he's played an active role in the development of supply chain networks and procedural security principles. So without further ado, we eagerly await your talk, Dan, and uh, we welcome you to the Transport Forum. And it is 4 a.m. in the U.S., if I'm not correct. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. That's right. It's 4.20, yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to start off with a, a little bit of humor. Um, and I, I preface that because it's supply chain humor. So those kind of are contradictory. But uh, does anyone, anybody know how many supply chain planners it takes to change a light bulb? Anyone want to guess in the chat room? I'll go ahead and answer it. Um, zero, because the light bulbs are late. And that's the, that's the history of supply chain, right? We're always in trouble because assets are not where they need to be and they're delayed, especially nowadays as we see all the port congestion in Asia and throughout the world. So um, cargo, I believe uh, security does play a direct role in eliminating uh, supply chain disruptions in global trade. And I would, as a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say that cargo security is the byproduct of any effective or efficient supply chain. And programs like AEO and the rules of the game, the harmonization rules of the game that became um, um, into light in June, I, I think it was June, correct me, Ray, if I'm wrong, but I think it was June of 2005 is when SAFE was formulated. And then AEO was harmonized in 2007. But those rules of the game were very important. And trade security, um, our, our kind of metric for that is really something very basic, which is overages, shortages, and damages. So I would go so far as to say that supply chain is an asset management program, and therefore AEO is an asset management program. So in order to talk a little bit about that, and how does one take the enormity and the complexity of SAFE and all the moving parts in an AEO program, C to C, B to C, OGAs, how does one take all that? And I guess it's very simple. We have to start with um, real world projects. And so I'd like to talk about a, a small real world project that we just finished completing in about February of 2022. I'm gonna go ahead and try and present my screen here. Technology is wonderful when it works, isn't it? And okay, and I'm gonna get my little laser pointer. I think I learned that this is a laser pointer. Okay, very good. All right, so recently we did a supply chain real world project um, to look at one aspect of the supply chain that I believe has gotten attention in the past, but over the years has lost a little bit of attention. There are three flows in the supply chain, as you all know. And that is the material flow, uh, the financial flow, and the information flow. And together, they form a cable, like a fiber optic cable, to ensure that all of our economies are literally interconnected. And we saw that interconnectivity um, in full display during COVID. So uh, what we did in Peru, and I'm going to get rid of my distraction here of me on camera and go, go ahead and uh, there we go. Okay. So what we did is in Peru, we started with a, a, a baby project, and that was to look at um, the three flows, but then um, look at the material flow in a little bit more detail. And we always know um, that there are constraints coming at us at all time. If it isn't a port strike, a man-made natural disaster, a natural disaster, there are all these things that we see on a regular basis coming at us at full speed. They have not gone away no matter what we have done to improve security from 2001 to 2022. In addition, we have now e-commerce, which enables having to target economic order quantities of units of one, which is unheard of. We've never seen that before until modern times uh, have been enabled through e-commerce. The other thing is we have de minimis values, which may be hurting our, our treasury 
because now things fall be below a, a threshold because they're being shipped in quantities of one and maybe misclassified. And so all these things are coming at us in real time. Not Now, the other thing is not knowing where the problems are is probably the worst part of that. And if we don't know um, where the problems are and where we are still weak, then we're not truly managing these assets uh, in global trade. So we're still weak in a lot of areas if we were to look at certain things. And one of them that I'll drill down into is the the perpetual ISO 17712 uh, panacea that, that I call it. Um, it literally is not a panacea. And um, what we don't realize it, is it went through drastic changes back in 2013 and became effective in 2014. And we still are missing uh, a, a big piece of the puzzle. And we need to reemphasize that. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But these things here, um, limited awareness, for, for, for example, of attack methods, whether we're talking about trade-based money laundering or whether we're talking about um, falsified documents or whether we're talking about the material flow in the supply chain, whether a uh, seal, for example, has been attacked without any evidence. All of these things still impact us in real time. So this means uh, we continue to be highly exposed to risk and our false sense of security makes us constantly vulnerable to supply chain variants, which is variance is the worst thing we can have in supply chain because supply chain is supposed to be choreographed and designed for a specific financial outcome. Um, and if we don't have true custodial control, then we really can't control the supply chain from event to event. And if we don't know that, then we're not efficient, we're not effective, and we're not creating value as the supply chain is, is designed to be. So what we, what we see is, yes, we're digitizing, we're modernizing, and uh, we're ensuring that those uh, flows are immutable. But for what Verna and, um, and Ray were talking about to really take fruition, we, we can't forget the material flow. The material must be as immutable as the financial and information flow. So that's, that's another important point. So in short, um, there are serious flaws with the materials flow in, in global trade. Um, there are known and proven methods to clandestinely attack conveyances, um, specifically the seals that we use, and that ISO 17712 is a false sense of security when not uh, appropriately addressed and when you don't read the fine print with ISO 17712 version 2013. Um, so in seconds, the majority of you can defeat a seal probably within five to 10 seconds using these known attack methodologies. And there's a couple of YouTube videos that you can go out there and, and, and see. But the bad guys who, who use these attack methodologies on a regular basis, they are prolifically great at, at attacking. And the bad news is there's no um, uh, evidence that we've been attacked. Now, so what's in ISO 1712-2013? Well, the so what is there's this thing called clause six. Yes, there are other parts which finally improved back in 2013 about you know, tensile strength and uh, independent lab testing and having proof of independent lab testing. But when you read clause six, um, it tells you that you're supposed to have tamper evidence and that that tamper evidence must be tested by an independent lab. And you're supposed to, when you buy a seal from your vendor, that vendor should have proof from the independent lab that um, meets clause six. And unfortunately, we forget about this. And this is one area that um, drastically needs more attention. Um, there are plenty of seals in the world, I would say 90 plus percent, that can be violated in seconds um, without any evidence. What we want is the evidence. Not, not any seal is... Uh, um, a permanent barrier. A seal was not designed to be a permanent barrier. And the last thing we want in the supply chain is a lock because a lock can be opened and closed by various uh, um, individuals. We want a seal. A seal is like the, the, the seal on, um, on an old envelope with a wax seal on it. The, the king's ring was the seal 
And in order to have the king's um, seal, you would have to cut off his finger, which was highly unlikely. So the last thing we want in a supply chain is a lock. We want a seal. And we want to know that that seal has been destroyed in order to get into it. So clause six is very important. Now, in order to put some of this um, theory into practice, uh, we ended up uh, partnering with uh, Peruvian Customs and we looked at a, a pilot. And in the pilot, we wanted to make sure that things were very, very practical. And in practicality, I meant that we would look at a low tech industry. We would look at this small country. We would make sure that whatever technology we deployed was practical. We wanted to ensure that only AEOs were um, um, invited to this pilot. Um, we always wanna give benefits to authorized economic operators. And the goal was to look at constraints that mitigated or hindered um, improving custodial control. This wasn't about deploying any type of particular technology. It was about looking at constraints, taking a, um, a constraint management approach to the whole supply chain and trying to improve that custodial control. And then to learn from weaknesses in the pilots. But what was important was not to overthink it. We needed to be um, very quick, obviously keep the, the, the immensity of the mission in mind, but to start small. So that was another very important part. So what were the elements of the whole pilot? The elements were basically to look at AEOs, educate them on weaknesses in the supply chain, look at weaknesses in custodial control, then look at the entire market of available technology, mechanical, digital, et cetera, and then start looking at the weaknesses of the technology and try and um, fine tune what we would use to the end. And so this was the whole um, array of uh, the mission that we had in this small pilot. And there were two pilots, version one uh, was just customs within customs and then version two, which ended in 22, which was customs with AEOs in the agricultural industry. Now, after testing numerous um, different options out there, we finally uh, settled on a mechanical cable seal with a five millimeter cable um, and a, um, a 1500 millimeter length. And the 1500 millimeter was very important because it, it got both um, doors on the container or the truck and it, um, it grabbed both of them with the cable. And so even if the hasp were removed, which is one of the tricks that uh, the bad guys use to remove the seal without any evidence, um, you couldn't get into the container because the, this, uh, the cable was holding the two doors together. So we looked baby step by baby step at what were the tricks of the trade for the bad guys. And we slowly tried to find a solution that would, uh, that would help us with that. And then, um, the other thing that we realized is a seal of any kind is useless if we don't have a tracking and tracing system that complements every milestone in the supply chain. From the birth of a seal made for a unique manufactured uh, product for a specific um, uh, origin destination in the supply chain, for a specific exporter, for a specific user in the supply chain, all of that needed to be captured somehow at every filter in the supply chain. So that was an imperative as well. So the pilot program basically looked at uh, tamper evidence and across, I would, I would say about uh, 6,000 transactions, what ended up happening is Sunat realized through these pilots that they needed to change the laws of their country. And in, in about 2019, because of the pilots, version one and two, um, they slowly saw that their original change of the rule back in 2019, um, not only rule, I should say law, in, and this is the published law in bold there, they changed the laws of the country based on the first iteration of the pilot such that tamper evidence had a definition in the legal framework of the country. And that was a big deal. So the use and control of SEALs became a codified in law because of pilot version 1.0. And because of pilot version 2.0, which we just finished in 2022, they codified the tracking and tracing um, component as well. So the pilots were, were, were very, very important in, in, uh, in helping codify into law some of the things that were 
kind of loosely interpreted, um, interpreted some things that were loosely um, practiced. And so that changed dramatically. So um, the important thing was we involved AEOs, their experience, their participation was important in looking at new constraints, managing constraints. There was some creativity as well that was happening on the part of customs. For example, they were uploading uh, NII imagery into the track and trace system. So any destination customs authority could not only see the entire life of the seal, the conveyance uh, filtering that was going on at any milestone in the supply chain, but they would also get important NII imagery in the same track and tracing system by using the mobile platform or using the web platform by scanning the 2D dimensional barcode of the seal. What that looks like in the system um, is you would see on the bottom part, oh, I got a laser pointer. If you go down here to the bottom, you would see when the seal was produced, when it was transferred to the exporter in country destination, when that exporter transferred it to other warehouses that, that were gonna use the seal, when they uh, initially loaded it at origin with and, and attached it to a container, the photographic evidence that went at origin with the seal so that there was no trickery, then when it was filtered, leaving a certain part of Peru, then getting to another part of Peru, then getting to the next part of Peru, then getting to the next part, and then finally making it to the port. And before departure, Sunat would filter the seal one more time, and that would be registered in the entire life cycle. And at any point in this physical supply chain, photographic evidence could be uploaded and even NII imagery could be uploaded. And you would see that the seal number had a unique codification. There's only one of these made in the world uh, for this specific use. And that specific seal was made for this specific exporter and only the specific user could have access to the system to attach it. And only designated users in the supply chain could filter this seal. And everything had geo and temporal evidence, including the container. Um, so then what that enables us to do is actually um, have geo and temporal physical data that is immutable for this life of this transaction. We would have obviously the photographic evidence that also had geo and temporal uh, stamps. And this mechanical seal is immutable itself. You have to destroy it in order to open it. If you try and cut it here on the cable and then re-weld it back, it'll turn black. If you try and heat this up or freeze it, um, if you heat it up, it turns blue. Uh, if you try and freeze it, um, the mechanics inside, the three locking mechanisms inside do not allow for any mechanical piece to expand or contract in such a way that the cable can be defeated. Um, so we know the origin, the destination down to the exact location. And you figure, how did we do this? We were not using GPS. Well, we have the next best thing. We have supercomputers in our hands that are called mobile phones that have um, the ability to give us geo and temporal evidence. And so we used something as ubiquitous and as simple instead of an RFID scanner or a GPS scanner. And all that modern technology um, has come a long way. There are good um, uh, electronic solutions out there. But we didn't want to start with an electronic solution. We wanted to start with a ubiquitous, mechanical, simple, deployable solution that everybody has in hand so that we can prove that even with a low tech industry like agriculture um, in a very small economy uh, would be able to deploy a sophisticated solution um, of, this, of this degree. Uh, here you see another example of a container. And in this container, um, it went from a certain part of uh, Ecuador all the way to Peru before it was exported. And we had all this evidence. This picture here, and you see the geo and temporal evidence when it was taken, so you can't cheat the system. Um, it shows us that they applied the seal incorrectly. They should have applied it down here where this fiscal seal is at. The cable could have run next to this fiscal seal and then wrapped around the two uh, bars of the door and then gone back in here. So here we already saw an anomaly in Sunat when they got this photograph at, at origin, they were already able to send this to secondary because they knew this, ca this cable seal was applied incorrectly and they knew that with uh, almost a day's anticipation. So 
Um, I wanted to leave you with that, um, that pilot because I wanted to let you know that training and awareness is key. And um, if we want to bring the safe framework of standards up alive, if we, if we want to truly enable a smart border of the future, what we need to do is we need to make sure that um, we, we give training and awareness to our personnel. That's the single most important security feature on the planet in 21 years of AEO, okay? Or 21 years of supply chain security and from 2007 till now of AEO. That's probably more correctly stated. We need to be flexible and innovative. For example, like Sunat was uploading NII images in this very basic platform. Um, we don't wanna forget through this digital transformation and um, everything that's happening with secure ledger technologies and, and, and things of that nature to enable the material flow to also be enhanced. Um, that's another very important part of, of this um, part of the supply chain. So I wanted to leave you with that. Um, and I can open up later on in questions if you have any questions. Um, but that's basically what I, I wanted to present to you for now. Okay. Hopefully I'm on time this time. I tend to talk a lot. Trying to get out of here. Well done, Dan, for staying awake. Uh, you fooled us all. I don't think I would have done so well at four in the morning. Thank you. That was it was actually fantastic just to hear more about a practical implication. Um, and I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions to follow. Um, I need to just move along now because we've got Gavin Kelly talking and he's got some time constraints. So thank you, Dan, for that. And we look forward to the Q&A. Um, all right. So our next speaker is Gavin Kelly. Um, I'm sure he's no stranger to any of you. He's the Chief Executive Officer of the RFA, the Road Freight Association. And Gavin has been involved in the resource strategy and operations field for about 32 years, from operations, leadership, coordination, and training to leadership development, lateral management operations, and business survival training. Golly, don't we need that? And over the years, Gavin has been involved in the development of numerous standards and procedures, and he's involved in various SANS standard committees and has served on various agency boards. So without further ado, we welcome Gavin Kelly and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Gavin. Thanks very much, Marcel. Um, good morning to everybody. Let me just see if I can get that going. Uh, let me do that. There we go. Right. I take it everyone can see it. And it. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Harry. Th thanks, Marcel. I must admit that, um, uh, first of all, I was very, very impressed with, with the presentations that SARS have done. And, and I've probably walked a good 10, 15 years. No, maybe only five years. I was. That gives away some people's ages. Um, with SARS and in getting to where we are with the borders. And I know there's a long way to go, but really, really, I must congratulate them and everyone involved in that. In, in assisting them and working on things behind the scenes in getting to where we're going. And if you look at what is being proposed going forward, it only sounds but better. So, so to Ray and her team, and I know I've singled only one person out, but uh, I, I've known Ray for a long time and I can remember in the very beginning, we were chatting about things and they finally come to pass. They might, they might all come to pass once we've long crossed another border into the great white blue beyond, but, but so be it. Um, Right, I'm presenting on behalf of Yudin Singh. He was going to present today, but unfortunately he's been taken ill and I understand that he has now gone into hospital for some procedures and we wish him all the best. Um, we've had a slew of really bad news in the industry as you heard earlier on. So hopefully this is going to be, be a lot, a lot better for Yudin and he's going to recover pretty quickly. Yudin is the regional head of security for Unilever South Africa. So this is not his presentation. I've taken some of the detail, but I've focused mainly on the disruption in terms of road freight in the local and the cross-border sector. Right, very, very briefly, I'm going to very briefly deal with 
who the Road Freight Association is, just in case you don't know, what we are, so what comprises us, what we do sort of. And then I'm going to look at the supply chain disruptors. And in terms of this presentation, these disruptors are really all negative disruptors or disruptions, if you'd like to call them that. And I'm going to really focus on, on three areas, the harbors, the borders, and then the security threats, which are really within the country itself. Okay, so who is the Road Freight Association? So we've got roughly 500 members. We have been seeing a couple of resignations in the last couple of months where businesses are closing. And that is a reality and something that we are really, really concerned about. And we have been speaking to a number of ministers about that, especially around the areas of security, which is one of the things we're talking about today, as well as that dirty word for all of us, the fuel price. Of those 500 members, 400 of them are transporters. Um, and 88% of those 400 members are SMMEs. A lot of people think the RFA is just composed of all the large operators, so all those well-known household corporate names. No, a lot of the operators in the RFA, and operators is the legal term for a transporter, so those transporters are there, as you see on the screen. Owner drivers, a huge proportion of, of our membership as well. And that's where our future lies in terms of any sort of business, are those small businesses. And something that we are always pushing with government is to look after those, those owner drivers, the, the micro and the small businesses, because they are the future. Yes, the big corporates are also important. And then we have two other categories. So obviously, the other 100 members lie within those categories, which are affiliates and associates. And you can see, I'm not going to read through that with you. You can see who they make up. And they really support our members in terms of either services that they supply or in terms of equipment and actual hard things like trucks and tires and what have you. We are a not-for-gain association. So we don't make any profit. We do try and make surpluses so that we can run certain projects. And there are a number of things that we do that we try and create a surplus. And we can then fund that, uh, whatever we would need to do that we couldn't fund out of our membership fees or the sponsorships that we get. We are fully registered. And why am I telling you this? Because it's an important point and something that we have been really trying to raise with the various departments, especially labor, when it's come to that most important little thorn or maybe large thorn in the flesh that has bugged us all these years in terms of foreign employment and those who say they represent and those who say that they are organizations who should be listened to. So you can see that we have registered with all the relevant authorities that we need to register with and we are a voluntary membership which is interesting because around the world in best practices you'll find that transporters are required to be, sorry about that, required to be part of an association. So in the States or in the UK or in Australia, there are a number of associations, but before you can get your operator cards or your registration certificates or whatever the case may be as they're termed there, you need to be registered um, with an association and the associations are compulsory. So that's something that we've also been working on and could probably have resolved a lot of issues in terms of, for example, the foreign driver matters and wages and the way in which uh, employees are treated. We've been around for some time. Um, and some of you might not have been around for that long, but it shows you how long this trade association has been around. And then it's not a government in organization at all. It's staffed by a, a core set of, of staff members and then some skilled individuals that we bring on online in terms of service agreements. Right, so what are the supply chain disruptors? What, what is creating the problem for us? Well, they're the ports and, and these ports are, are the harbors. The, this is not the term for uh, the customs reference for a land port or a border crossing. So these are the Durbans and the Cape Towns and the Richards Bays, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then there are land borders. So those are our crossings with our various neighbors. Then there's the origination and distribution issues that we face. So coming from manufacturing, coming from the agricultural side, in between the various steps in a logistic supply chain or in the life cycle 
of a commodity or a product. Then the one that all of us right now, I think is second on our list next to fuel, which is electricity supply. Then of course, the security threats that we face and then organized crime. Over the last couple of years, crime has really got itself organized in terms of what would seem to be a systematic and coordinated attack on the supply chains, the logistic supply chains. And they've changed their modus operandi as we seem to be able to break some of those attacks. They seem to be one or two steps behind us. Right, let's have a look at the ports. So what are the things that cause the disruption, cause the delays, and then open those doors for a lot of the criminal activity that you've seen? And you've just heard a discussion around containers, and, and this is really a fertile breeding ground for being able to attack those containers. And we've had instances where the containers only aren't only penetrated or broken open into, where containers have actually disappeared. So they've grounded, they've landed, and they disappear, or they disappear between ports on ships. There have been some interesting cases of, of how containers and goods have disappeared. So one of the first things that we have an issue with, and it's been a really, really a difficult thing to solve, is the truck booking system. And we need to learn from what happens around the world in terms of how we deal with getting, and I use the term box for a container, how we get these boxes in and out of, of ports or harbors as efficiently and as quickly as possible. You all know we have huge queuing problems. When we had those floods down in KZN a couple of weeks ago, I'm not talking about what's happening right now, port road, the, the, the access roads to the port, the main road to the port, the actual areas where the containers were staged were just inundated with water, but there were queues of truck standing. It's not uncommon on a normal day to have at least three or four kilometers of queues of trucks, either trying to get boxes in or get boxes out. So that whole truck booking system needs to be re-looked at. And we need to look at staging. Um, and you would have heard that SARS has also said that in terms of borders that you stage the vehicles away from the actual point of, of operation or interaction or crossing in their case. And the same thing needs to happen here. And we've got to look at, at how we can have a system that allows the trucks that are there to be identified. So whether we geofence that, there's some sort of recognition so that the trucks that are there in that queue can get in, get their boxes and go. The, right now, we have strange situations where, where trucks are in the queue, but the boxes being sent out of the port or accessed into the port belong belong to trucks further back in the queue. So that's something we've, we've really, got to, really got to solve. Um, weather has a huge impact in terms of, of being able to sail and dock, and that brings into the scenario a whole lot of penalties. But again, you have these containers or boxes standing around, which then makes them susceptible, easy targets to be, to be attacked and broken into. And one of the things we still have a huge amount of, of, of problems with is how people, when I say people, the criminal element, how they know what's in the boxes. Because quite often we, are, we, we use shadow boxes, we try and hide what's in the boxes in terms of, not from customs, but in terms of from the, the, the criminal ability to be able to attack certain boxes. Then we have strikes and labor disputes. And as soon as that happens, the whole system clogs down. Uh, operating policies that, that contradict with one another. So you will find that, that a port operates one way and the depots around them operate differently, which means that even though the port might be operating 24-7, the depots around or the places to which the trucks go immediately then don't operate 24-7. And so you have, you have trucks standing around and again, the, the containers being open to, to being attacked. Um, our ports... The efficiencies really, really are under huge pressure. And that is for two things. We've, we've had this tremendous um, weather environmental impact on the ports. But the second thing is that the architecture, the infrastructure, the machinery really is old and it's beginning to degrade. And it's just unfortunate that 
this is the reality. We don't seem to be able to be improving that and getting that sorted out a lot faster. We're really almost like an Eskom scenario. We are repairing what we've got. We haven't been able to, to jump into the new technologies and really get that, that sorted out. And, and that really does make, make a difference. A quick, a quick depiction of what happened and what the costs were in terms of, of those weather effects down in the port a couple of, couple of weeks ago. And you can see it quickly comes into a couple of millions. And those couple of millions might not be much when you compare them to billions, but there's a lot of operators, transporters in there who've lost their businesses. And there's the opportunity with all the delays for that criminal element to play in there. And that criminal element is becoming a bigger and a bigger threat to logistics chains. Then land borders. There are mismatches between countries. And I know that, that SARS referred to that. And there's a lot of work being done. If we think back 10 years ago, what those mismatches were like, we were electronic. And on the other side, they still remained paper and, and wanted everything handed in, huge blocks of paper. But those mismatches are there and they are slowly being addressed. And we say slowly because obviously for us, it's not happening fast enough. But there is movement to that, which is great. Data sharing, you would have heard Ray and you would have heard um van are talking about about those three pillars and the sharing of data and blockchain and that has made a huge difference and that is something that we really have to work on is are those links and and and, and working together to make sure that there's this fast progression through what traditionally are almost hurdles or almost doors one-way sort of doors um manual systems still clog a lot of the processes and we need to get those manual systems out because in the manual systems is the opportunity to fiddle you will see that i mean it's not just in terms of customs you will have seen that many reports over and over again how driver's licenses or vehicle licenses or number plates anything that is manual there's always a part in that chain where you can fiddle with face value documents or what would be presumed to be the real thing, even like SEALs. You would have heard Dan speaking to that as well. Um, then registration. I think one of the, the best things SARS has done in terms of borders was drawing a line in the sand and saying, well, if you're not registered, and the AEO program that's coming is one of those fantastic things, but if you're not registered, if you don't play the game, then you're not going to be allowed into the game. And, and, and that is very, very important. Because with that, again, as you would have heard Vanna saying, and I think Ray also said it, you've got various other databases that you can then correlate or verify or confirm exactly what's happening in that space. Smart borders, I think most of us understand that. There are players out there who don't understand that. And quite often, there's still this push and drive to go into, into these fancy one-stop building type type borders, it's getting people to understand that automation and AI and all of those things aren't going to end up in, in Terminator. They're going to end up in us being able to move far better, sharing information, not moving towards, towards land borders, I almost called them ports, land borders or ports, before you're cleared to go there. Because congestion through non-compliant operators or transporters is really one of the biggest bugbears that happens at a land border. And once you've got all of those trucks standing all over the place, then criminality becomes rife because it becomes very difficult to police each and every single box, container or vehicle. And then obviously it's, it's one of the, the, the areas I know everyone is, is, is working with are the, the archaic structures that are there. The borders weren't created when they were built years ago for the free movement of goods. They were created to control people coming into the country, but I think there's some movement in there. The border management agency is probably going to have a huge amount of work to do in terms of that. But again, once we go to smart borders and artificial intelligence, then a fair amount of that physical presence will be reduced in terms of, of having to do that sort of, sort of work. Just, just a picture. Um, and we've all been there, we all understand that, but you can imagine that not only is that a headache, 
for, for all of us, but within that sort of context is where that criminality happens and they start breaking in. And, you know, and those who have containers, metal sides and what have you, are far safer than those guys who are running curtain siders because that just takes a simple Stanley knife to cut those. So now transporters start putting wire mesh and special cables into those curtain siders, which obviously down the line has a cost impact that you and I will pay, but it shows that how vulnerable these sort of, of movements are. Then going more sort of right to the beginning of, of the logistics chain, so where goods originate, then to the other side of it being distributed. So as soon as we have unrest or labor strikes, and that's something that for us has been a huge headache. Somebody doesn't have water or they're unhappy with a neighbor's grass because the neighbor's grass is green and theirs is blue. Therefore, they think all grass should be blue or yellow, whichever the case may be. There's this unrest, roads are blocked, and it is right now the best target is a truck because once you burn a truck, there's a far bigger fire than if you burn something like a small, I don't know if the car still exists, like a Fiat Uno, that's a very small fire. But once you burn a truck, there's lots of fire, good media hype, good attention, you can get focus on what you're doing, you disrupt what's happening on the roads in terms of traffic flow. And again, lots of looting happening. So, so local service delivery and, and, and labor unrest is a huge problem for us. No matter, it has nothing to do with the logistics chain or the transport sector, but we get sucked into that. I don't know how many of you have been watching the latest trend, there have been some horrendous stories about crops being destroyed while still on the trees or still in the field. I don't know what term you want to use. And the avocado mafia wars that are happening. I, I was shocked when I read this. But the same is happening in citrus. The same is happening even in livestock and, and certain types of, of plants. Um, so that's a huge problem. And again, transportation gets disrupted or gets caught up in that and, and gets destroyed. We all know about COVID-19 and what that has done and what sort of lessons have come out from that. I think definitely the transport industry has changed. I know a lot of physical interaction has changed, but there are a lot of shortages that were created by that. Geopolitical issues and the impact of that, like the fuel shortage and the huge costs that have. So now you find that there's a, a targeting of commodities on the trucks, food, a huge target. There's a huge, huge aftermarket or um, criminal market syndicate that works on that. Fuel is another one. Corruption playing into, into this. So there's a lot of investigations that needs to happen, loss of loads. I think three days ago, the SAPs gave us pictures of loads they've recovered in the, in the Gauteng area, the masses of food that they've recovered um, over the last couple of months is absolutely mind boggling. But this is a huge thing. And there's a lot of, of inside a role player happening in terms of this. Subcontracting. There are there are uh, many, many instances where there are multiple subcontracting practices happening. So it's not just one from a, a, a major transporter to, to a, a smaller one. There are actually three or four involved between the origination of the product, whether it's something like coal or it's something like a foodstuff, to the actual distribution points where it's going down to the retail stores. So in between that, a lot of, of subcontracting, which opens up a tremendous amount of free space for criminality to be, get involved. So many more checks and balances need to be in place. And then one of our biggest bugbears is the lack of security on, on routes, distribution centers. Now, one can always turn around and say, and there've been many of these sorts of comments that shouldn't the road freight industry now have armed convoys or, or have security around the trucks and put security personnel on. And in the first instance, security of, of routes, security of law and order or making sure law and order is in place isn't really what 
the sector should be doing. And, and of course, once we start playing in that role, there are so many other issues that could happen. You could just imagine the type of hoo-ha that would happen if some security officer on some truck shot somebody. I mean, apart from that is not on and not acceptable, the escalation that would happen. So now the criminal in, uh, um, element would attack the trucks literally with firearms and shoot everyone before they did anything. So security of routes and of key areas like harbors and distribution centers, as we saw that there wasn't any sort of real reaction or real force in those July 21 riots is really of concern. Just a quick look. I know most of us are going to be chewing our wrists off come a week and a half time, just showing you what's happening in terms of the fuel price and that sort of impact in terms of the road freight industry. And of course, it pushes the criminal activity in terms of trying to get those vehicles that are moving that fuel. So we're looking at more or less about four and a litre increase in two weeks time. Really hope that something's going to happen in the meantime. Electricity supply. Well, obviously there are disruptions. The most important thing is that fair amount of our security system, whether it's electric fences on the one hand, but all of the other monitoring. So that's where artificial intelligence and all of those sort of processes then can be um, broken down. They can find suddenly find they're not doing what they need to do. So we need to have backup supplies, but there's disruptions, there's delays. And again, the criminal element can get in there. There's administration systems being affected and then the delays through the various ports so either the harbors or then through air operations and, and rail operations we've seen what's happened to the rail network you drive along railway lines and the lines are gone and so are the electrification lines it's actually actually shocking so it puts a lot more pressure into the road freight network and and then raises its profile as a target look at what's happening in terms of load shedding and that affects us along that whole supply chain. If you look at where we're going this year, it's on a steep curve. And that is something of concern, as I've noted, in terms of being able to minimize the risk. Then the security threats that we face from a local point of view, it does happen cross-border, but there's, this is really what's happening within the country. Um, hijacking has been on the increase and the way in which it happens has changed. And we've had one or two really, really good breakthroughs end of last year, this year, a couple of gangs that we've been able to finally get together. But the hijacking is changing. They don't only go for the trucks on the road. They actually now go to the depots. They go to where they have intelligence of where the cargo is sitting. They're not just going for one truck anymore. They're actually going for the mother load. I spoke about protests and unrest. They pop up all over the show. I saw something this morning on our security groups in various places in the country. And it's so difficult to be able to manage that and to get the trucks out because quite often they're already on that schedule, on that route, and alternative routes aren't always available. A lot of looting or what we call slash and grab. So a lot of vehicles run with curtain siders. And while they're moving in major centers where they're not moving fast or even stopped at a toll gate, they slashed open and they are looted. It's really, really become out of control. So, so key point areas like toll gates and where you have to stop and pay really needs a far greater security presence. We unfortunately have driver misbehavior where drivers are involved. And there have been enough cases for that. There are lots of good drivers out there. Not all drivers are involved in this, but there's a fair amount of that. And it's being able to really come up with a number of solutions to address that. And one of them is having some sort of a central base in which we can, once people have been found guilty by a court of law, there can be some sort of database or some sort of system to ensure that that risk isn't reintroduced into the industry. Crime syndicates really have grown exponentially in the last five years. And again, there's employee collusion with that. Blue light gangs, we have had some successes. But once again, you will see there have been some warnings out in the Ekuleni area about a blue light gang. And it's actually quite amazing how long it takes us to actually catch these guys and, and get them. 
um, to boot and to and and to stop this sort of thing. Um, I've spoken about an employee vetting procedure in place. That is that is really something we've we really really need to get in place. And then the ATDF, the All Truck Drivers Foundation, is is a concern because they attack trucks because of foreign individuals. And hopefully, the government is going to make those changes that that we've proposed in terms of how to deal with that matter, as well as the other visa or the labor required issues to address that. So I know that's a very busy screen and I hate things like this, but just look at the figure down at the bottom and you'll get this presentation from Harry. You can see what it's cost. Nine billion has been lost to the country or nine billion cost into the road freight and logistics sector in terms of a number of things that are happening there. And we can't afford that as a country. We just cannot afford that. Coming towards the end, I've got one slide after this, Harry. Um, I've been speaking about organized crime, and it is really, really, really an issue. It is something that we really have to get under the belt. We have to solve these issues because it has an impact on everything. And as we, as we um, outsource parts of the supply chain, as we go into different modes, so we need to continually concentrate and come up with ways in which of dealing with organized crime. Here's a stat on, or, or a display from the BSI on, in terms of what has been stolen or what are the high risk cargoes around the country. And you can see that fuel's there, um, but so is food. Food is, is, is a big thing. So, you know, a lot, a lot of escorting or a lot of focus is placed on, on moving fuel, which is correct, but food is also, food and beverage, also a huge thing. Hopefully, I have given you a bit of an insight into what's happening out there. Hopefully, it isn't all doom and gloom. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for giving me some time to do the presentation. And back to you, Harry and Marcel. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, much appreciated. This was an excellent presentation. Uh, talking where the tacky eats the tar, as they say. And uh, I think it was great. Well done, Kevin. Uh, we always appreciate you calling a spade a spade. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, ladies and gents, I'm just trying to figure out my screen, what's happening here. Just give me a moment. Yeah, thank you, Gavin, for that and for also stepping in. Um, quite sobering, that last slide, I think. Um, we are all feeling the pinch on that front. Um, I think we're going to have a five minute comfort break if that suits everybody. I'm sure you're dying just to stretch your legs and grab a cup of coffee and what have you. Harry, are you going to put a, a clock up on the screen so that we... Yes, myself, thank you. I'll pull up a five minutes clock. And okay, uh, so... after, the, after the break, we still have exciting presentations. Only two of them, but very exciting, and we're looking forward to that. Okay, great. So we'll we'll see you back in five then, everybody. Thank you.
Great guys, let's take up our seats again and uh, give opportunity to Marcel to be our MC again. Thank you, Marcel. Well, let me let me do this one then. Um, now, next presenter. Hi, Harry, I'm here. Oh, there you are. There you are. <laughs> no, I just had to come speeding back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, great. Um, have we got Patrick on the line? Yes, yes we do. Is. Good morning. Morning, morning. Um, Okay, super excited. Um, let me introduce you to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Patrick Simmons, who is an ex-United States Customs and Border Protection. What can we call you? Just a VIP, I think, for the session today. Um, Patrick retired from US Customs and Border Protection in 2011 um, after a 27-year career. Um, I'm sure you've got a lot of stories to tell us, Patrick. Um, Probably too many. <laughs> Patrick served in many senior management positions during this tenure um, with the CBP, including five years serving as the director of the non-intrusive inspection division within the Office of Field of Operations. Um, and upon his retirement, uh, Patrick then accepted the position of chief advisor to Abu Dhabi Customs, and was actually tasked to design, procure, and oversee the deployment of the world's first totally integrated sea container examination and detection system for the new seaport of Khalifa within Abu Dhabi. And um, as you can imagine, it attracts many visitors and security agents from all around the globe. And this is a one of a kind security system um, which really does provide the people of the UAE with an unprecedented level of safety and security, which is welcome during these troubled times. And Patrick is an internationally recognized expert in the field of non-intrusive inspection systems. So we eagerly await your update on um, container security and the initiative which you're going to actually elaborate on today. So thank you so much, Patrick. Well, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be, be here and be part of this uh, wonderful forum. Um, and I have to thank Dan uh, for inviting me and getting me involved in this because it is something that's extremely important, um, both in the US and around the world. And the speakers today, um, this morning, or through the night, I guess, from, from my perspective, um, have been extremely interesting. And it's uh, funny, Gavin in particular, um, that presentation could have actually been given about our Southwest border here in the United States, uh, which is an absolute mess at the present time, as I'm sure you've all heard. Um, but the gangs are prevalent. Um, the uh, containers are, are ripped off uh, on a daily basis. Um, gangs are looting. I mean, it's really the same, really the same story. And I, I fear that this is a, um, a worldwide problem um, that is not really being addressed by any of our governments, unfortunately, um, to put an end to this. But uh, more about that later, I'm sure. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, today I'm going to speak a little bit about the uh, Container Security Initiative, or CSI. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be um, involved in the creation of this particular program, um, along with a, um, a very good friend of mine named Al Gina. Uh, Mr. Gina is also retired, but he retired as an assistant commissioner uh, for the Office of Trade. Prior to that, he was um, in the uh, Office of International Affairs, where most of these programs um, started from. So let me just share my screen, and we'll get there. Okay, there we are. Can everyone see see that screen? Is it just like view? 
Great, great, very good. Okay, so um, as as Marcel said, um, I spent 27 years with um, the custom service, then with CBP, of course. Um, uh, I retired and went over to Abu Dhabi, which was probably one of the more interesting um, uh, times I've ever had. Myself and my family spent five years in Abu Dhabi, um, where I was the um, uh, advisor to Abu Dhabi Customs. And believe me when I tell you, that was more of a culture shock than even I expected. Um, five years went by in a heartbeat. Um, and um, it, was, it was something where I was able to learn even more about um, my NII uh, uh, and how the rest of the world views NII and uses NII it was extremely interesting because when I was in Abu Dhabi, of course, I got the opportunity to travel throughout the Mideast um, and uh, speak to different custom services and, and um, learn about their particular views and such. Very interesting time. And um, it, it was a great time to be there because that was the time when uh, the world first started integrating uh, different systems together. And I had the opportunity to do that in Abu Dhabi. And I, I'll be happy to speak about that another time because that'll take hours. Um, but the container security initiative um, was probably one of the more um, discussed, internationally discussed uh, programs that um, CBP put out. And um, of course, this was a result of the 9-11 uh, tragedy uh, that happened in, in uh, New York. Um, CSI- Sorry, thank you, Ed. Sorry, can you just go to slide view, please? Click on slideshow Sorry. and then select the yeah, yep. button. Yeah. Better? Perfect, thank you. Yep, okay, great. Um, the CSI program was, was one of the ones that were started uh, directly after 9-11. And um, unfortunately, that, that day will, will um, haunt us forever. Um, but some of the good things that came out of it, uh, there always is good that comes out of tragedy, um, if we can look for it. Um, the supply chain was tightened up. Um, different programs were started by CBP, um, by custom services around the world as a result of that. Um, of course, the um, uh, Container Security Initiative was one, the Safe Ports Act here in the US was another, and um, different levels of security were assigned to different ports depending upon their size. And I think that this is one of the, the excellent things that happened. The Safe Port Act um, really, really turned security back on the ports of entry. And again, um, I, when I say ports of entry, I'm not only speaking of the customs uh, definition, but the one that um, the rest of the public uses. Um, additional requirements for maritime were put in place. Um, all kinds of different security were, were assigned to the ports uh, as far as scanning and screening. And we'll talk about that as well. Um, but one of the um, great programs that were started, I believe, was the radiation portal program. Um, that was under me. Um, I, was, I was lucky enough to um, be involved in that from the get-go. And um, I think that was one of the better programs that came out of the whole Safe Port Act type of environment, whereby um, all containers coming into the US uh, were scanned for radiation. And it's kind of funny um, because we didn't, at that time, we didn't know what we didn't know, right? And um, I will always remember the very first day uh, that we went live with that program. There was a container that came in across uh, from Canada and it was carrying uh, uh, airplane dials and radium dials. And we didn't know, right? So the container went through at the port of Detroit. The alarms went off, the truck kept going. It took us three days to find the truck um, only to find that it was full of radium dials. But it, it, it just goes to, sh to, to show that when we put these these devices out there, um, we learn a lot more about what's actually in the environment. And, and uh, for, for one, myself, um, I never knew that there was that much radiation traveling around on our highways. Um, most of it is harmless, um, you know, but uh, there's, a, there's a, a whole different group um, that we should be aware of that are traveling on our highways. And I'm sure you have the same um, the same type of commodities that are traveling uh, over in South Africa and, you know, throughout the world. Um, so one of the other programs that started uh, 
directly after 9-11, of course, was the uh, Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism, or CTPAT. And um, this has been an extremely popular program, uh, one that's been uh, put in place, and, and there are literally uh, thousands of, of participants. And again, this has shined a light um, on the supply chain from, from stuffing uh, straight down through the constant E. And um, it's, it's uh, been operating, been extremely successful. And also it has uh, opened our eyes to the problem at the stuffing, um, which is where, of course, um, a lot of the problems begin. Um, what CTPAT does is it actually goes out and, and does inspections at these stuffing um, facilities, both announced and unannounced, um, and has opened our eyes to internal conspiracy, which of course is always our biggest thing. Uh, our biggest threat in any business is internal security, um, excuse me, is internal threat. Um, and CTPAT has gone a long way to educate the world about just how prevalent um, theft and, and um, insertion of narcotics and, and anything else really is at that particular point when the container is the most vulnerable. A friend of mine, Mark Tierney, um, who is the uh, VP of security at Maersk, always tells me the only time a container is safe is when it's moving. Um, the only time a container makes money is when it's moving. Um, and uh, now being um, a recovering uh, customs inspector, um, I realized that uh, it's our job, all of our jobs, to keep containers moving and to keep them safe. Um, and uh, I'm sure that most of you on this on this call have um, had that situation as well. And you would all agree that keeping the containers fl flowing is is our number one pri priority. So the um, oh, sorry about that. Um, the Container Security Initiative was launched in 2002. Um, not such a popular program in the beginning because it said that um, the host country um, had to pay for and perform inspections on containers uh, that the US decided were a threat. Um, these containers would not be allowed to uh, get on a ship if the, if the inspection was not done or if CBP, the US, decided that that container shouldn't, shouldn't travel. So it, it wasn't the most popular thing world, worldwide. Um, in years since it's been um, initiated, I believe that um, we've all learned to kind of work within those parameters and um, the targeting has gotten so much better that the amount of containers that CBP has to be examined overseas has, uh, has dropped quite a, quite a bit. And with the advent of, um, as Dan said, is different, smarter and, and uh, tamper-proof seals and things such as that, um, the security of containers is getting better. But you know, to my way of thinking, we still have a very long way to go before we can say you know, that we have successfully um, found a, a, a device that can give us all the security that we know that we need. Um, so, this is a basic slide of, of how the container security initiative works. Um, I'm sure everybody is, is uh, familiar with it. Um, containers leaving the US um, are examined overseas by the host country. In some countries, uh, the CBP officers who are assigned to um, the host country are permitted to, to watch the exam. Um, in some countries, they are not. Um, and that's totally up to the host country. And um, uh, in situations where officers are not permitted to watch the actual exam, in many cases, they're given pictures um, uh, or they are uh, given the NII slides themselves. And I'm gonna st start talking a little bit about NII, non-intrusive inspection, because that is really the major part of this whole program. This program would not be possible without NII. Um, and um, those of you in the trucking business, I'm sure, um, wish that we had a different type of NII that wouldn't take so long. We've heard all these um, different scenarios where uh, x-ray is either not healthy for the driver, it's not good for the cargo, um, and the x-ray companies have gone a long way to say that, in fact, x-rays are not harmful um, at low dose. 
I always laugh because before any uh, non-intrusive inspection, right before the x-ray machine, they have a, a sign of a pregnant woman, you know, with the slash through it. And I say, well, you know, um, if pregnant women aren't allowed through it, um, it can't be too safe. And um, that's something I always like to put out there. Just say, you know, it's it's um, radiation at, at any level. I don't believe it's safe for human beings, regardless of how many times you go through it. Um, but um, we'll talk more about that in a moment as well. But it just goes to say that um, from the last 15 years or so, there have been great advances made um, in NII, both with low dose NII, like a Z portal. Um, CVP is now experimenting, as I know other, other places are, with a multi-energy portal, um, which gives the driver a very, very low dose of radiation, um, able to see what's in the cab. And then as the cab passes through, the, um, the level of, of X-ray is turned up to interrogate the container. Um, the problem with that is, is that it's still not enough in my view, and in the view of many others, um, the, the um, amount of X-ray that's given even after the, the cab goes by is not enough to interrogate the container. You, you're only see, seeing in uh, maybe 400 millimeters and that's, that's really not enough. Um, there are other sy systems out there that I'm gonna talk, talk about at the end that will give you a much better view of what's inside the container um, as the container goes through and doesn't use any radiation at all. But we'll get to that in one second. The elements of CSI, again, um, in my view, the most important is the non-intrusive inspection. Uh, border control units, again, uh, ramping up the security around the port of entry itself, electronic processes, advanced customs information, again, who's coming, who's going. Uh, we need to know all of these things. And of course, um, probably the, the uh, the most um, prevalent one, the one that's growing rapidly is the automated risk management. Um, every country now that has um, a custom ser service that's doing its job has a targeting unit, um, targeting both passengers and cargo. And again, this is um, something that's difficult to do because as was said before by Gavin, a lot of places um, that we deal with still deal with paper. Um, I was over in Kenya um, a few months ago, and um, sure enough, they have the same problems at that border with uh, Tunisia. Um, there, there's all kinds of problems over there as far as trying to get um, countries aligned with, with what they're doing on, on their borders. Peru has the same problems. And Dan, I'm sure, is very familiar with that. He spends a lot of time over in Peru. Um, so this is this is a slide that just um, brings to bear that there are 58 operational CSI ports. Uh, CBP has hundreds of officers placed around the world. Um, and again, the CSI program sees about 80% um, of the maritime containerized car cargo uh, is, uh, is um, screened and targeted um, for, uh, before it comes into the States. It's a great program. Um, it does a lot of good. Um, and again, I think it's come a long way from its inception where it really wasn't uh, a welcomed program by a lot of places um, outside the US. Smart borders. So all of this is, is, um, is contributing to a smart border pro program. And again, um, when we talk about that, we're talking about electronics and, and the technology that's available on the borders is just growing in leaps and bounds. Um, everything from digital container inspections and, and uh, cameras that can do just about anything you need them to do, um, to radiation portal monitors, um, better NII, but probably in my view, um, the biggest advance that's happened in the last 15 years or so um, is radiation free or passive NII scanning. Um, and I'm gonna talk about this more because I believe, and um, I've actually seen the system. Um, I do work with the com company that um, manufactures it. Um, it's, uh, it's called Discovery. Um, it used to be called the MMPDS, for those of you who may have seen it or heard about it in the past. 
And it actually um, gives a three-dimensional scan of a uh, container, much like a CT scan. You're able to look at that container in a 3D mode. You're able to slice it any which way on both the Y and the X axis, open it up, look inside of it. It's an amazing piece of uh, tech technology. It's 100% safe and passive. Um, no iodizing radiation whatsoever. No exclusion zones. It's safe for people. You can actually work inside the scan tunnel. The officers can work with the canine while you're taking the scan. Um, image slicing, as I said, the uh, first scan is available within 30 seconds of the container entering the scan tunnel. Um, driver remains in the, in the cab, which again, speeds the process. Um, I think the days of a uh, driver being escorted by uh, the officers out to a safe space, um, or in most cases, a lead room uh, are gonna be over. Uh, because there's just no reason for it. You have to shut the truck down. You have to start the truck up again. In many places, for instance, like Los Angeles, they have um, rules that say how long the truck can actually be running during the day. So if you're waiting in line um, for the NII for an hour or, or, or more, you can actually um, be told to shut, the, shut your truck down and sit for a, a while before going about your route. I mean, it, it, it's getting that pervasive that um, drivers are, 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 um, are getting really annoyed at the fact that they have to stop like that. Um, but the average scan of this system is about 3.5 minutes. Um, and uh, this is a picture of it here. This is um, the bottom one here is a picture in Abu Dhabi. So you see this big building, right? And um, the building itself is not necessary. In Abu Dhabi, it was because otherwise the people working it would be uh, melted by the sun. And I can tell you from personal experience that uh, it gets hot over there um, and stays hot 724 once it gets hot. Um, the top view here is a picture from Singapore. There's a system over there as well. And um, you can see that it's not quite as big as it looks here in uh, Abu Dhabi. These are different um, views of how the scan actually appears to the operator. Again, um, the less dense cargo appears kind of like a cloud. So you don't actually get edges and such. The way that the system works is it takes, um, uh, it looks for differences in density. And when it sees those, it, it, it will give you the uh, outline in different colors. So, uh, the more red the color, uh, the more dense the commodity that's, in, that's inside. And again, um, I hope that um, I, I answered um, questions and I'll be happy to answer more. I'll stay on until the, um, que the, answer, uh, the question and, and answer session. And um, I'd be happy to speak more about any of the topics that I spoke of. But again, I wanna thank you very much for inviting me. And um, I look forward to perhaps uh, working with this group a little bit more as, um, as we go on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. And this is we'd, uh, we'd love you if you're able to stay on for the for the Q&A. We know it's really, really early in the morning. And um, thank you for sharing those insights with us. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. that. It was really, really informative. Um, OK, so our last speaker is Mr. Theo Ferri. He's the Director of Security and Occupational Health and Safety at DHL Express. Um, Theo actually started off in the military, where he spent about 16 years and ended up as an officer's rank. Thereafter, he spent two years in logistics in the UK and, and then ended up with SAA um, in head of investigations and where he completed his MDP. At DHL, he started his career as forensic investigations, adding aviation security and health and safety portfolios. And Theo is currently the Director of Security and Occupational Health, as I mentioned, and also aviation post holder.
for aviation security. So we are in very secure hands with our next speaker and we welcome Mr. Theo Fareed. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. It's a mouthful. Um, I didn't think I said so much. And like I said in, the, in our discussion, I want to keep it as short as possible. But anyway, um, yeah, and for those guys who want to know about South African Airways, nothing. No comments there. I just want to share a short video. Um, it is about four minutes long. And uh, just to encompass everything that is um, associated with parcel security and a smaller parcel service. So, Ari, just let me know if you, if you get a sound as well. Is the sound on, Eddie? Uh, do you know we don't see anything yet? Nothing on. Yeah. No. Let me see. Let me just stop it there and see which screen, because it is the right screen that I'm displaying. Is it on now? It's coming. Yes, yes, you can hit play. And that's and working, yes. Sound as well. Every day, you know, we pick it up and delivering very valuable shipments for our customers. The security of those shipments is, is paramount, um, you know, to our reputation and to our relationship um, with that customer. Complacency is not an option um, when it comes to security. At DHL Express, security is built on three critical factors, infrastructure, processes, and people. Investment in the latest equipment and technology, TAPR accreditation and excellent security training for all its people provide the assurance customers, such as Nokia, need. DHL Express has really the right mix between people and technology. So you are investing into your people as you are investing into technology. We've built up over the years a very, very good reputation for security excellence. We're the global leader in terms of TAPA certified sites. Because TAPA certification is really something where we can trust on, there's no need for us anymore to come to your premises and check your premises. But state-of-the-art infrastructure is meaningless without consistent global processes. And the ones customers trust are the result of years of international experience. You know, we've been in all these countries around the world, um, you know, far longer than all of our competition. And we've built up processes which are geared up to each individual country. Yeah, our customers expect us to have a secure network in every sense in the word. So thousands of small actions every day embedded in our process make it a secure network. It's incumbent upon each and every one of the DHL employees out there in the field to ensure they follow the policies and the procedures each and every day. But probably the most important contributor to the security of DHL Express is down to a very human factor, its people. It's absolutely the responsibility of everybody. I, mean, I just can't say this often, often enough. People are really the most important aspect related to mitigate your risk within an end-to-end -end supply chain solution. Prevention rather than cure should be our mantra. So it's absolutely important that we remain vigilant and on our guard at all times. In fact, DHL Express takes security awareness so seriously, every one of its people undertakes certified international specialist training. An international specialist needs to understand that security is critically important uh, within our business. You know, people can make the difference and people will make the difference. Train your people. It comes back to being an international specialist. In today's world, security is everything. Protecting its people, its global network, and its customers' shipments is of paramount importance to DHL Express. As those customers appreciate, speed is important, but winning performance also relies on secure defenses, and it's that security that keeps DHL and its customers ahead of the game. If you need me, call me, no matter where you are, no matter how far, just call my name. Manchester United to the world. That's the speed of yellow. DHL Express. Excellence simply delivered. Thank you, Harry. Um, if you can just share my um, presentation, please, then I can start on this side. 
All right, the topic that I must discuss with you is the challenges and security aspects uh, associated with small parcels. And it all stems from the e-commerce business. Now, obviously, through the pandemic, um, your e-commerce um, grew exponentially. And there's a lot of more customers that, um, you know, rather prefer to go to the, the shops themselves. They do go online and they procure their equipment or their shipments um, online and have it uh, this, um, sent to them using a transport service or a courier service in the, in the world. So what is the responsibility and what's the challenge that we're facing with this growing and enormously growing uh, business um, uh, part of the uh, world? So e-commerce vendors. So first of all, that is something that is, uh, that's a concern. You're working in a criminally charged environment. We know that you're, shall I say, um, um, more adventurous criminals can go into ventures like, um, you know, your cyber crime stuff. And e-commerce is definitely one of those aspects of business which is targeted by those uh, criminal elements. So, yes, they, they will go into the facility and they will, they will uh, provide a service to the world through an e-commerce platform. So what is the responsibility of a, you know, a, um, a, a good company to associate with them? Is verify, first of all, the type of goods and product that they are procuring and providing to the world as um, uh, products available. And there's a number of things that we should look into. And it's not only, you know, specific companies, but also who we associate with. You know, what is the potential of copyright infringements? And we've seen it in a lot of cases that especially the intellectual property rights has been infringed. You know, you can buy an iPhone maybe from a, a location somewhere in the world which is not normally associated with iPhones. So that's part of the the you know background check so to speak to verify that the vendors that are providing this service to the world or this um, shipment parcels and and uh, equipment to the world is legit and it is it is part of that um, due diligence of background studies that is needed to be done you know there's some more um, notoriously um, yeah, yeah stuff like the child labor um, uh, examples whereby it, we need to confirm and need to verify and make sure that uh, those people is not exploited. It's not only child labor, but it's also in places like in, you know, some places like India, for example, whereby long hours has been exploited so many times. We look at peak seasons, you know, Black Friday, um, your notorious Christmas peak seasons, whereby additional workforce is required to associate or to at least um, comply to the requirements from the local population and the, and the customers out there to make sure that the e-commerce vendor can provide all of those. And that's also something that needs to be verified. You know, do they exploit those additional labor um, during those peak season um, periods? Then the next slide, please, Harry. So the next slide is what is the, the requirement from, you know, from a, a responsible company when we inject these shipments into the network, into the supply chain network? You know, verify, verification of the equipment or the shipment sent um, at um, accepting into the network is quite important. You know, it all links up to what is um, declared. So again, the customer and customers are notoriously for, you know, for buying anything from um, children's toys to electronic equipment, to electronic goods, a, a wide range of equipment and shipments can be bought. So at the time of exception, verify the shipment inspection is there. So someone might declare, I'm sending you a, a hard drive or a mobile phone, and instead is something else. So that is part of that ins inspection uh, process to make sure as well that the description of goods is accurate. All the customers, and we've seen it now this morning with the, the SARS people, as well as every speaker so far, referred to the customs process. That's always important to verify that when we send something to the next destination, that whatever is declared is accurate, and the next station. Um, through the customs clearance process can verify up front and during inspection that what was declared at origin is what is received at destination. Declared value is so important. The commercial invoice part of that, you know, as a, uh, a, a pickup service, we cannot maybe verify that the actual declared value is correct, but it should be in line with that. At least the documentation must be fully important or fully enclosed there that we know that that um, uh, declared value will be displayed to the customs receiving shipments on the other side. Known shipper concept is actually a big thing and we've seen it in e-commerce uh, e factors. So someone like, and so I don't want to use the, the well-known names, 
um, but um, let's use a Zimbabwean president in the past. Those sort of people might be on a denied party list in many countries. And, uh, you know, as a uh, responsible uh, transport service, one should verify that that uh, uh, shipper is known to the network and known to everyone, including all the governments and the government um, representatives. Next slide, please, Harry. So shipping integrity is quite an important thing as well. Um, I think a number of people refer to the illegal goods, narcotics, counterfeit goods. It's something that we need to verify too. You know, whenever a shipment is um, given to a, a, a transport service, that that shipment remains, in, the integrity of that shipment remains like that. So you provide a cell phone, there's not something else that's derived on the other side. So nothing like in narcotics, that sort of thing is inclusive of that. And I think when you refer back to my video earlier, you see that each one of those processes, processes should be policed by a intrusive or a non-intrusive system to verify that the commodity displaying through the e-commerce platform is accurate. Next uh, slide, please, Harry. So the ship and security part of it, um, I think you slipped one there. Uh, the condition of ship, and that's a, a quite important thing there. I think that picture there displays. So when we got the image from the e-commerce um, vendor and how it's been transported through to the end, um, with the, in, the, in, the, in the parcels, how do you receive it at the end should be intact. And that is one of the big things that we have verified as well. You know, there's a lot of people in the gauntlet of security that can have their fingers into that system. Um, every speaker so far said, you know, theft is there. Um, slashing of um, your side panels on big trucks. It happens in the smaller parcel industry as well. That those uh, security threats is associated with the smaller parcels too. So verification from beginning of the uh, process until the end of process, all in between there should remain the same. And every time when there's a change in the profile of the shipment, there must be a, a proper verification or a control process a part of that. Next one, please. That's the last slide. <clears throat> this is related to the shipment utilization and customs clearance at the end of flight. Um, I think um, the SARS people mentioned that is that um, when the shipment arrives at the end destination and the, the, the shipment uh, inspection or the customs clearance inspection is performed, that the true value of the shipment reflects what is happening in country two. So you can buy a, and I'm again, you're gonna use a mobile phone at a uh, place of manufacture at a much cheaper price. It must be in line with what is the selling price at destination. If there's a massive, massive discrepancy, it will obviously raise the eyebrows and a lot of questions will be asked about the integrity and the, the value as declared by the customer. So that in nutshell is, you know, some of the challenges that we observed through the e-commerce platform. And like I said in the beginning, e-commerce is growing exponentially. And, uh, you know, with all of the, the massive growth in there, there's a, again, a lot of potential for um, insecurity and uh, security challenges related to the e-commerce platform. Harry, thank you. It's very fast and very quick. I know we're running short of time, but thank you so much for the time of it. Thank you, Sio. You certainly were a speedy delivery, um, just as you are at DHL. <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> and for um, covering so much in such a short period of time. Um, Harry, I think because of the time, we should move straight on to the Q&A. Um, I think we've got Louise Wiggett, who's going to help us um, manage the Q&A. Um, I know they were Marcel, quite... Could we ask the panelists who are still on the call to kindly switch on their videos and unmute themselves so that I can see them in the list and then I can bring them into the panel. Um, Ray, I think we Vanna had to step off for some operational matters, as far as I understand. So, Harry, we won't be having uh, Vanna no. join. 
Right, I think I've got everybody. Am I missing somebody? You see. Uh, just, <clears throat> Harry, just Theo? Uh, Theo, okay, let's bring in Theo. Theo is, Theo is online. There we go, there we go. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. Um, and I want to extend a big thanks to all the speakers for the very informative information. Gavin, it's nice to see you online and not see you on TV for a change. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for being available. And a very big thank you to Patrick and Dan. You look all awake. I'm not <laughs> sure what time of the morning it is. <laughs> so I, I assume you've had your, your coffee, coffee shots by now. So because of the shortness of time, I'm going to skip on to the questions that was in the Q&A. Um, and Ray, apologies, the first one is coming your way since you were the first speaker. And the question really was around, and I, I think I agree with the sentiment that um, customs moder modernization with technology has really benefited out of the COVID situation. I think we suddenly have a move towards digit digitization and, and things that we've been working on for 10 years has suddenly now become possible and um, important. Um, so the question really is uh, asked, uh, how can we, through the AEO and SAFE program, improve the integrity of the um, flow of the goods? Um, you know, just from your perspective, I know uh, the AEO program is, is very critical and close to your heart. Um, so maybe you can just give us some indication of, of what you think is the two or three most important things that we can use out of those programs to, to ensure that we have a safe and secure supply chain. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Louise, um, and thank you for the question. Uh, certainly, as you've suggested, AAO is very close to my heart. I'm, I'm very passionate about it. But I must also say that uh, in South Africa, our experience is if we're dealing with a, a company with an international footprint, certainly the idea of supply chain security seems to fit very well and is built into their existing processes and uh, uh, even the technology that is being used. Um, so from our perspective, it's really uh, where I'd like to see us be is to get all South African companies up to the same level of uh, awareness of uh, the supply chain security issues. Um, and more importantly, the sort of efficiencies that can be gained uh, in having a, a far more improved supply chain uh, uh, system, security system. So from our perspective, obviously we're looking at how we can explore some of the new technologies. Um, and more specifically for us, we're looking uh, at areas where we can improve some of the trade facilitation issues that we are experiencing at our borders. Uh, as we know, uh, the African continent is, is a, a big uh, area for, of expansion for South African local businesses. And it's how we then ensure that we build supply chain uh, green lanes through Africa and through to uh, the rest of the continent and obviously uh, capitalizing then on the uh, free trade uh, agreement and how we can then create those uh, trade lanes for uh, South African exporters. Not sure that that really is three items, uh, uh, Louise, but certainly items that will uh, remain on, in our focus area for the next year. And then obviously very interesting to see the presentation from DHL because our next area that we have to evolve our own program to is, is how we have an AEO program for e-commerce and how we build that. And, and uh, luckily, I think that from a supply chain security perspective, international careers like the, the likes of DHL certainly lead the way. Um, so I think that we can capitalize a lot on what they really have in building the program for e-commerce. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Ray. I was going to touch on the e-commerce aspect because I think, Theo, um, you were quite right in saying there's been an absolute explosion of, uh, of um, e-commerce. And I think it's just going to get um, keep going because if you look at the volumes that's currently, um, we're already sitting on volumes that they predicted for 2025. And I think to loop back to Gavin and the, the road trade industry, 
is that you know the the focus and the way of doing deliveries is also changing you know not necessarily um, the bigger vehicles but also the concept of last mile delivery is becoming very prevalent and and that brings a whole other aspect around smaller vehicles you know going into areas where you don't normally travel um, you know the safety and security aspects about somebody carrying high value parcels into a neighborhood for example stuff that we've got to look at Dan, I'm going to ask you to maybe comment on the next question. It was really a question for, for Werner, but I think you're going to be able to answer it. It was a question from the Citrus Growers Association that is really asking, is it possible to get um, a tamper um, um, evidence process um, and also maintain a cold chain? Because that's kind of one of the things, once you've got a cold chain and you don't really want to break that cold chain by now having to go through customs and security processes. So maybe just in short, Dan, your view on whether that is possible from your experience. And maybe Patrick, um, you've worked in this area a lot. So if you can maybe give us some insights on that as well, that will be much appreciated. Well, a couple of interesting things come to play, like some of the things that Ray was saying about uh, pillar three of the safe framework of standards with OGAs, that becomes very important because if we're talking about food supply chain. We're talking about an agency that controls food and so food safety. Um, the other aspect is perishability, right? Um, citrus growers, um, huge export for um, South Africa is economically perishable and classically perishable. So we don't want to break the cold chain in any way. And we want to keep, as um, Gavin was saying, we want to keep the asset moving, right? Um, Pat, you referenced that as well. And so if we can assert through an export program that the container has not been tampered with in any way, and if we could use um, safe non-radiological NII, like Pat was talking about, there's no reason why we couldn't have uh, a green lane export for Citrus Growers Association of South Africa, for example, right? There would be other things that come into play. However, um, it, it could all come together. And that would probably be another great way to start a pilot, by the way, hint, hint. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, uh, Werner probably could answer that question better than I, but I, I think we see the confluence of everything that we talked about here today being a viable way forward by starting small, thinking big, and be quick. Uh, no, that thank was... you, Dan. And, and Patrick, if you can maybe just add <clears throat> sure. to your, your experience, because I, I like the idea of a, a, a Citrus AEO pilot and looping that back, Gavin, we've got Le Bombo open now. And thank you, Ray, for 24 seven, so we can push the volumes through, because I think at the moment, we're severely constrained in Durban. We're going into Citrus season at the moment. So we are going to have to be agile and look at other routes to get the volumes. I coincidentally sat um, next to a whole group of citrus farmers um, last night on the plane, and they already kind of going, how are we going to get this stuff out? And we're going to have to be clever um, to get this stuff out. But Patrick, over to you. Sure. <clears throat> well, um, Dan was, um, was, was right. Um, Conventional x-ray. The problem is uh, when when citrus or, or any water laden vegetable fruit or uh, frozen food go through x-ray, the x-ray has trouble penetrating water and or ice. Um, the new system that we were talking about, the passive si system, uh, was made with that in mind. So um, it's it's very funny, the company that <clears throat> makes it is called Decision Sciences. And they came to me back in 2008 when I was the director for um, US Customs. The first thing I asked them was, how long does it take you to do a scan? And they said, oh, very quick, about 45 minutes. So after I threw them out of my office, um, you know, I said, you gotta be kidding me, that's just impossible. I, you were gonna get me shot, you know? Um, so I, I continued to watch the uh, technology for years and, and now a scan takes, you know, three minutes tops with the first view coming in 30 seconds. The great thing is, is that this particular technology can penetrate a container of oranges. X-ray cannot. So the only way that customs has to examine a container full of oranges or pineapples or, or avocados for that matter, anything, 
is to unload it or damage the fruit. Damaging the fruit in this situation, it can be simply opening the container. That's going to lead to damage and perishability, as uh, Dan said. The passive technology um, uses muon tomography. And I'm not going to get into physics because none none of us have time. But this penetrates every um, material known to man on Earth. Amazing, amazing technology that was invented uh, or used to actually scan the pyramids. Um, It's been on National Geographic and all that. But um, look it up, um, Decision Sciences, and there's a film on there that kind of goes through through it. But I think, as Dan said, um, it's time for a pilot. And um, I know that I could um, help with that particular project if you find value. No, Patrick, thank you very much. And I think, Ray, um, it's um, part of these sessions that Harry runs is really to get private sector and public sector collaboration. And I think we're all here ready to, to start looking at opportunities um, and, and how we can work together. Because I think um, what has been fantastic for me over the years is to see how the Transport Forum has grown to get these parties together and for us to look at opportunities. Gavin... Yeah. I've got a difficult one for you um, because really, <laughs> um, I, I think, and, and thank you very much for your presentation. What, what was scary was the numbers involved and, and really I sometimes wonder how the road transport industry keep, still keeps going. Um, um, I think we say Africa is not for sissies, but I really think the transport industry is not for sissies at all. The question was really around you know, do we have the capacity um, with all this crime going on in the road freight industry um, that to prosecute the people when they are found? Um, I can just say from my participation in the road freight industry, we do from time to time get good news messages where syndicates are really caught. And maybe, Gavin, you can just comment around um, what has happened over recent times and, and, and that there is good work being done on that front. Um, I think it's also a collective industry initiative. So over to you, Gavin. Oh, thanks, Louise. So now we've worked out that that um, if we use the technology used to scan the pharaohs and, and, and their embalmed fruit, we shouldn't have a problem at afforded. Did I get that one right? Anyway. <laughs> it doesn't harm fruit and it doesn't harm mummies. We're good to go. <laughs> Like to note. Yeah, Louise, um, you know, there have been horror stories and they, they only haven't only been in the last three or four years. Uh, you know, you know, um, attacks on freight and logistics trains goes all the way back to when man or, or the human being first started moving stuff from a point A to a point B. And we have this term, should we not put people, should we not ride shotgun? And where does that term come from? And I suppose our friends from the US will remember the Wells Fargo type scenario where a chap sat up front with a shotgun to keep those undesirables away. So there there are really two things. The first thing is that we need to secure the information that is out there. And that has always been a concern. And and it isn't necessarily the information that is shared with SARS. That can be information just within its own company, its own transport originating company, or between the client uh, the consignee, the consignor, if you want to use those terms, but the client and, and, and the seller of the goods. So that's the first thing. And, and it's to be able to make that as secure as possible. Then it's really around securing as it moves. And that's not the role of the Road Freight Association. We try and bring what the challenges are to the attention of, of the people who need to know that. SARS is one of them. Uh, SAPS is another one of them, uh, various security companies and or companies producing things because sometimes things happen in a manufacturing environment that the manufacturer is not aware of. The real challenge has always been getting those who were the victims of the crime to actually a report the crime because sometimes people don't report crime because they have their own, for want of a better Uh, description, their own loss mitigation system. So they don't have insurance. You have people who, because they're insured with an external party, then need to report this so they can have some sort of loss, um, uh, covering of their loss that they've had. But you get a lot who don't 
they, they, they ensure within themselves. And it's trying to get that concept through, that, that we need the reporting, not because we want to know how bad your systems are. That's not the point. The point is about where the loopholes are. Then it's getting people to share information without seeming to be collusive. We've got very tight anti-competition law in this country, as you know, and it's trying to get people to say, okay, I lost fuel here over this area and getting people to share that. We've had some wonderful successes. You know, everyone looks at the bad things that happen. And yes, there are daily attacks, but we've had some wonderful successes. SARS has had some wonderful successes. I mean, you know, as I said earlier on, Ray and I are only 24, 25 respectively. And we have <laughs> tried to break some of these things down over a number of years. And there have been some important, really, really important gains that we've made. But it's around reporting. And I think I've seen that in our industry, people don't share information. So they need to share that information so we can feed, for want of a better term, SARS has a thing called a risk engine. So then we know where our risk lies and, and how to mitigate that risk. Um, yes, and this is my final comment, sometimes the SAPs is a bit slow, but they are slowly getting there. I think we've turned the corner. Um, I, I'm an optimist. I think we are starting to get it right. And with blockchain, which I know you all drove, and with sharing big data and with being open, you know, if you want to hide something, you're going to hide something. But if, if we share what is happening, we can together secure all of our loads, get our borders working better. And my final point is, thanks, Ray and Sars, for doing what you did at Limbombo. Is is the headache. Thank you. <laughs> No, I think I think on that positive note, Gavin, thank you very much. And I think um, Theo um, and Ray, we're glad you met online for your um, your next one is an online coffee date or uh, maybe an a in-person date to get the AEO program for e-commerce going. Um, just because we're running slightly over and cognizant of everybody's time, if there is any further questions or anything, or you need to get in contact with our very distinguished panelists, um, we've got their contact details. Um, the presentations will be shared also. Um, if there's any more information that you need, welcome to reach out. And I just want to extend a big thank you to all our speakers. We know that Vanner had to rush to go and be a customs officer due to <laughs> the, the SAR strike. Um, I kind of tongue in cheek said, well, um, you know, maybe this is a good test to see how good our smart borders are, where we don't need people and we can have a clinical border zone and we can get through the border quickly. Um, we collectively can only make things better. And I think I want to go back to my favorite Madiba quote to say it always seems impossible until it's done. And if South Africa is a country after what we've been through in the last year, and particularly, I don't know, for some unknown reason, Ray, because Natal has done something wrong because they've really been in the firing line. Um, collectively holding hands, we can do things better. We've got wonderful people like Patrick and Dan that's got good experience um, that can help us and give us some insights. And I want to thank everybody and all the participants as well that joined us today. It was a great session. Harry, over to you just to say the final words, but thank you very much, everybody, and stay well and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Global Trade Solution, to, you know, for hosting this event. Uh, I think it was excellent. And <clears throat> Louise, I, I wish I could have you as a moderator for, for every event for this panel discussion, you're so sharp and you can understand and see the bigger picture. Thank you so much also for your guidance and mentorship uh, to the Transport Forum myself. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your involvement in this, in this platform and we believe that there's are many years to go and many years to come and you will still have a lot of work to do. So thank you very much. Ladies and gents, yeah, thank you very much. You will also receive a, a email uh, requesting your feedback. Please, your feedback is very important to us also in terms of suggestions for future topics. Uh, we really need that and uh, we really make effort, you know, to build it into the program of the future. So thank you very much, everybody. 
and then take care. We see you next next time again. Thank you, Louise and DTS. Thank you, Harry. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.